Robert Children here to see the Kasuras. Mrs. Kasura, you look Utsukushi. Uh, I'm afraid I may be early. Not too early. Enter, Mr. Children. I have brought a gift to Graft to invite your most favorable attitude. Most kind of you. Selected from the finest objet d'art of America's dying culture. A flavor of our bygone days. Flappers used to wear them in the 1920s. I saw you looking at them in the store. It's decadent, of course, but still. Thank you. Please, a drink? Whiskey? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Kasura. Tasteful. Oh, very tasteful. I sense the wabi here, the harmony. Arigato, Kasura-san. Please, call me poor, and Betty. Then I am Robert. Hmm. Is this your collection? Would you like to see it? Oh, yes. Thank you. The pistol is our prized possession. Colt 44 of 1860. Issued to the Union Army. Boys in Brew brought it into the second bull run. <laughs> Please. Oh, thank you. So tell me, how do you verify what's real from any fakes? I have a practice eye. What a wonderful sense of history it exudes. Dinner is ready. Shall we? Mmm. Okay. Right. This steak is delicious. <laughs> we like to eat American food. You cook it to perfection, Betty. Thank you. Robots, do you like music? Hmm? Say, Bunk Johnson or Kidori. Dixieland jazz. You know, Paul, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with Negro music. I prefer the classics of Wagner, Beethoven, sometimes Bach. Perhaps if I played you a selection from the New Orleans Rhythm Paul, Kings... he does not know it. Robert, yesterday I saw an American say to his friend, Hey, you old bastard. But bastard is an insult, is it not? Ah, uh, well... Yes. And uh, all this also impolite. Sometimes insults can show affection. And we address strangers as friends to show we're angry. Ah, no. For instance, pal or buddy. You know, hey, pal, back off. Yeah, it's confusing. It's stupid, really. really. Subtle. Robert, perhaps you could help me with a book I'm reading. It's a novel from the 1930s by a U.S. author, Nathaniel West. The novel is Miss Lonely Hearts. I like it, but I can't seem to grasp the author's meaning. I have not read that book, I fear. Hmm. What a shame. The author has interesting things to say on suffering. Unlike Christians who believe there must be sin to account for it, Mr. West suggests that he might be suffering with no cause due to his being a Semite. Oh, well, we all suffered during the war, but if Japan and Germany had not been victorious, then Semites would be running the world today. Which I'm sure you would agree would be most... We hope you enjoyed your dinner, Mr. Children. Mm. Yes, I did. Thank you. Although, um, it's, uh, 
It's, it's still early? We like to learn, you see. We are still new to this country, so there's much that is strange. I'm sure there must be, although inferior, of course, to the Japanese way of life. Yeah. Well, uh, next time you must come to me. How about uh, dinner next week? I can make rice and miso soup. Next week we are busy, but thank you for your time tonight. Well, uh, a week after then? It was instructive. Thank you. Instructive? Of course. Well, I hope I proved a useful research opportunity. Arigato for your hospitality. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Thursday, March 3rd, 2022. So I have been told this is our book club fifth session on Philip K. Dix, The Man in the High Castle. We have one more session left and we're all done and even that session will be a half so we're right at the doorstep to being done thanks goodness uh since people were not interested in this book after all and interestingly we had a number of cows listeners who said they voted for this book they watched a portion of the amazon streaming series but were not significantly engaged and they thought the book would be better. We had at least two or three people who said that like verbatim, which I just, I, I'm still learning. But I said, wow, if I've, I've never heard where someone watched a television program and they weren't interested. And then they said, well, I'm going to go read the book. I think the book will be better. Like, hmm, that's, that is peculiar. At any rate, we just heard from said streaming series on Amazon, Man in the High Castle. And I can only say, Based on that scene that we just heard were Robert Chill Dan and Betty and Paul Kasura have dinner. Now, we read that scene some weeks back. It is way, 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 way better in the book. They leave so much out. That's the scene where they have that exchange about the music and children says I'm not into Negro music and all that and blah 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 and they reference the book I think they might reference uh, the grasshopper lies heavy at the meal we read but anyway uh, but children has children has all that internal dialogue where by the time they get to the end of the dinner he says, you know what these chinks you know they're just some monkeys we are white and they are not and the two are not the same and I am about to get out of here chink get my bags right remember he goes and he gets the pedicab and does all that like all that is totally sanitized from the streaming series so i too agree i think the television series is way less interesting than the book i would only say (sighs) gusty may may need to apologize for being disgruntled because the book is not bad and it does reveal a lot about racism white supremacy and even specifically what it means to be white children in the scene we just heard the book wow that is an extraordinary scene we had an extraordinary scene last week remember last week children begs the non-white male Paul Kasura for an apology like are you serious begging a chink for an apology and he said that you've insulted the white race and you're going to apologize to me it is absolutely fascinating. It's just, it is a difficult book. I said this past weekend, they speak German in the book. They're speaking Japanese in the book. They're speaking broken English in the book. Like it's a lot to process. You got all this World War II history and alternate history. It's a lot to process. You got spies. <laughs> so I get it. It might be one of those books that you have to read two times, three times, that sort of thing to really appreciate. But there is a lot you can learn about white supremacy racism without further ado we're picking up in chapter 12 this is right after the nazis they've stormed the japanese building uh mr baines mr takagi and mr tagomi uh they are all tadeki i'm sorry i messed the names up sir mr baines 
Mr. Tadeki and Mr. Tagomi. They're all together and they were having a meeting about the German plans to invade and then whammo the Germans coming to get Mr. Baines. So we will pick up in chapter 12 context of white supremacy the man in the Kai castle Philip K. Dick. At the bench in their basement workshop Frank Frink sat at the arbor. He held a half-finished silver earring against the noisily turning cotton buff. Bits of rouge spattered his glasses and blackened his nails and hands. The earring, shaped in a snail-shell spiral, became hot from friction, but Frink grimly bore down even more. Don't get it too shiny, Ed McCarthy said. Just hit the high spots. You can even leave the lows completely. Frank Frink grunted. There's a better market for silver if it's not polished up too much, Ed said. Silverwork should have that old look. Market, Frank thought. They had sold nothing. Except for the consignment at American Artistic Handcrafts, no one had taken anything, and they had visited five retail shops in all. We're not making any money, Frank said to himself. We're making more and more jewelry, and it's just piling up around us. The screw back of the earring caught in the wheel. The piece whipped out of Frank's hands and flew to the polish shield, then fell to the floor. He shut off the motor. Don't let those pieces go, McCarthy said at the welding torch. Christ, he's the size of a pea. No way to get a grip. Well, pick it up anyhow. The hell with the whole thing, Frank thought. What's the matter? McCarthy said, seeing him make no move to fish up the earring. Frank said, We're pouring money in for nothing. We can't sell what we haven't made. We can't sell anything, Frank said, made or unmade. Five stores, drop in the bucket. But the trend, Frank said, it's enough to know. Don't kid yourself, Frank said. I'm not kidding myself. Meaning what? Meaning it's time to start looking for a market for scrap. All right, McCarthy said. Quit then. I have. I'll go on by myself. McCarthy lit the torch again. How are we going to split the stuff? I don't know, but we'll find a way. Buy me out, Frank said. Hell no. Frink computed. Pay me six hundred dollars. No, you take half of everything. Half the motor? They were both silent then. Three more stores, McCarthy said. Then we'll talk about it. Lowering his mask, he began brazing a section of brass rod into a cuff bracelet. Frank Frink stepped down from the bench. He located the snail shell earring and replaced it in the carton of incomplete pieces. I'm going outside for a smoke he said, and walked across the basement to the stairs. A moment later, he stood outdoors on the sidewalk, a Tian Lai between his fingers. It's all over, he said to himself. I don't need the oracle to tell me. I recognize what the moment is. The smell is there. Defeat. And it is hard, really, to say why. Maybe, theoretically, we could go on, store to store, other cities. But something is wrong, and all the effort and ingenuity won't change it. I want to know why, he thought, but I never will. What should we have done? Made what instead? We bucked the moment, bucked the towel, upstream in the wrong direction. And now, dissolution, decay. Yin has us. The light showed us its ass, went elsewhere. We can only knuckle under. While he stood there under the eaves of the building, taking quick drags on his marijuana cigarette, and dully watching traffic go by, an ordinary-looking middle-aged white man sauntered up to him. Mr. Frink? Frank Frink? You got it, Frink said. The man produced a folded document and identification. I'm with the San Francisco Police Department. I have a warrant for your arrest. He held Frink's arm already. It had already been done. For what? Frink demanded. Bunko. Mr. Children, American Artistic Handcrafts. The cop forcibly led Frink along the sidewalk. Another plainclothes cop joined them, one now on each side of Frink. They hustled and toward a parked, unmarked Toyopet. This is what the time requires of us, Frink thought as he was dumped onto the car seat between the two cops. The door slammed shut. The car, driven by a third cop, this one in uniform, shot out into traffic. These are the sons of bitches we must submit to. You got an attorney? One of the cops asked him. 
No, he said. They'll give you a list of names at the station. Thanks, Frink said. What did you do with the money? One of the cops asked later on, as they were parking in the Kearney Street police station garage. Frink said, Spent it. All? He did not answer. One of the cops shook his head and laughed. As they got out of the car, one of them said to Frink, Is your real name Fink? Frink felt terror. Fink, the cop repeated. You're a kike. He exhibited a large gray folder. Refugee from Europe. I was born in New York, Frank Frink said. You're an escapee from the Nazis, the cop said. You know what that means? Frank Frink broke away and ran across the garage. The three cops shouted, and at the doorway he found himself facing a police car with uniformed armed police blocking his path. The police smiled at him, and one of them, holding a gun, stepped out and smacked a handcuff into place over his wrist. Jerking him by the wrist, the thin metal cut into his flesh, to the bone. The cop led him back the way he had come. Back to Germany, one of the cops said, surveying him. I'm an American, Frank Frink said. You're a Jew, the cop said. As he was taken upstairs, one of the cops said, Will he be booked here? No, another said. We'll hold him for the German consul. They want to try him under German law. There was no list of attorneys, after all. For twenty minutes, Mr. Tagomi had remained motionless at his desk, holding the revolver pointed at the door, while Mr. Baines paced about the office. The old general had, after some thought, lifted the phone and put through a call to the Japanese embassy in San Francisco. However, he had not been able to get through to Baron Kalamakali. The ambassador, a bureaucrat had told him, was out of the city. Now General Tadeki was in the process of placing a Trans-Pacific call to Tokyo. I will consult with the War College, he explained to Mr. Baines. They will contact Imperial military forces stationed nearby us. He did not seem perturbed. So, we will be relieved in a number of hours, Mr. Tagomi said to himself, possibly by Japanese marines from a carrier armed with machine guns and mortars. Operating through official channels is highly efficient in terms of final result, but there is regrettable time lag. Down below us, black-shirt hooligans are busy clubbing secretaries and clerks. However, there was little more that he personally could do. I wonder if it would be worth trying to reach the German consul, Mr. Baines said. Mr. Tagomi had a vision of himself summoning Miss Afrikian in with her tape recorder to take dictation of urgent protest to Herr H. Rice. I can call Herr Rice, Mr. Tagomi said, on another line. Please, Mr. Baines said. Still holding his Colt 44 collector's item, Mr. Tagomi pressed a button on his desk. Out came a non-listed phone line, especially installed for esoteric communication. He dialed the number of the German consulate. Good day. Who is calling? Accented, brisk male functionary voice, undoubtedly underling. Mr. Tagomi said, His Excellency, high rice, please. Urgent. This is Mr. Tagomi here. Ranking Imperial Trade Mission, top place. He used his hard, no-nonsense voice. Yes, sir. A moment, if you will. A long moment, then. No sound at all on the phone, not even clicks. He is merely standing there with it, Mr. Tagomi decided, stalling through typical Nordic wile. To General Tadeki, waiting on the other phone, and Mr. Baines pacing, he said, I am naturally being put off. At last the functionary's voice once again. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Tagomi. Not at all. The consul is in conference. However... Mr. Tagomi hung up. Waste of effort, to say the least, he said, feeling discomforted. Whom else to call? Tokoka already informed. Also MP units down on waterfront. No use to phone them. Direct call to Berlin, to Reich Chancellor Goebbels, to Imperial Military Airfield at Napa, asking for air rescue assistance. I will call SD Chief Herr B. Kreuzmann Mir, he decided aloud, and bitterly complain, rant and scream invective. He began to dial the number, formally, euphemistically, listed in the San Francisco phone book as the Lufthansa Airport Terminal Precious Shipment Guard Detail. 
As the phone buzzed, he said, Vituperate in high-pitched hysteria. Put on good performance, General Tadeki said, smiling. In Mr. Tagomi's ear, a Germanic voice said, Who is it? More no-nonsense than myself, voice, Mr. Tagomi thought. But he intended to go on. Hurry up, the voice demanded. Mr. Tagomi shouted, I am ordering the arrest and trial of your band of cutthroats and degenerates who run amok like blonde berserk beasts, unfit even to describe. Do you know me, Curl? This is Tagomi, Imperial Government Consultant. Five seconds, or wave legality and have Marine Shock Troop Unit begin massacre with flame-throwing phosphorus bombs. Disgrace to civilization. On the other end, the SD flunky was sputtering anxiously. Mr. Tagomi winked at Mr. Baines. We know nothing about it, the flunky was saying. Liar, Mr. Tagomi shouted. Then we have no choice. He slammed the receiver down. It is no doubt mere gesture, he said to Mr. Baines and General Tadeki, but it can do no harm anyhow. Always faint possibility, certain nervous element even in S.D. General Tadeki started to speak, but then a tremendous clatter at the office door. He ceased. The door swung open. Two burly white men appeared, both armed with pistols equipped with silencers. They made out Mr. Baines. Da is there, one said. They started for Mr. Baines. At his desk, Mr. Tagomi pointed his Colt 44 ancient collector's item and compressed the trigger. One of the SD men fell to the floor. The other whipped his silencer-equipped gun toward Mr. Tagomi and returned fire. Mr. Tagomi heard no report, saw only a tiny wisp of smoke from the gun, heard the whistle of a slug passing near. With record-eclipsing speed, he fanned the hammer of the single-action Colt, firing it again and again. The SD man's jaw burst. Bits of bone, flesh, shreds of tooth flew in the air. Hit in the mouth, Mr. Tagomi realized. Dreadful spot, especially a ball ascending. The jawless SD man's eyes still contained life, of a kind. He still perceives me, Mr. Tagomi thought. Then the eyes lost their luster, and the SD man collapsed, dropping his gun and making unhuman gargling noises. Sickening, Mr. Tagomi said. No more SD men appeared in the open doorway. Possibly it is over, General Tadeki said after a pause. Mr. Tagomi, engaged in tedious three-minute task of reloading, paused to press the button of the desk intercom. Bring medical emergency aid, he instructed. Hideously injured thug here. No answer, only a hum. Stooping, Mr. Baines had picked up both the Germans' guns. He passed one to the general, keeping the other himself. Now we will mow them down. Mr. Tagomi said, reseating himself with his Colt 44 as before. Formidable triumvirate in this office. From the hall, a voice called, German hoodlums, surrender! Already taken care of, Mr. Tagomi called back. Lying either dead or dying. Advance and verify empirically. A party of Nippon Times employees gingerly appeared, several of them carrying building riot equipment, such as axes and rifles and tear gas grenades. Cause célèbre, Mr. Tagomi said. PSA government in Sacramento could declare war on Reich without hesitation. He broke open his gun. Anyhow, over with. They will deny complicity, Mr. Baines said. Standard technique used countless times. He laid the silencer-equipped pistol on Mr. Tagomi's desk. Made in Japan. He was not joking. It was true. Excellent quality Japanese target pistol. Mr. Tagomi examined it. And not German nationals, Mr. Baines said. He had taken the wallet of one of the whites, the dead one. PSA citizen. Lives in San Jose. Nothing to connect him with the SD. Name is Jack Sanders. He tossed the wallet down. A hold-up, Mr. Tagomi said. Motive... Our locked vault. No political aspects. He arose shakily to his feet. In any case, the assassination or kidnapping attempt by the SD had failed. At least this first one had. But clearly they knew who Mr. Baines was, and no doubt what he had come for. The prognosis, Mr. Tagomi said, is gloomy. 
He wondered if in this instance the oracle would be of any use. Perhaps it could protect them, warn them, shield them with its advice. Still quite shaky, he began taking out the forty-nine euro stalks. Whole situation confusing and anomalous, he decided. No human intelligence could decipher it. Only five-thousand-year-old joint mind applicable. German totalitarian society resembles some faulty form of life, worse than natural thing, worse in all its admixtures, its potpourri of pointlessness. Here, he thought, local SD acts as instrument of policy totally at odds with head in Berlin. Where in this composite being is the sense? Who really is Germany? Whoever was? Almost like decomposing nightmare parody of problems customarily faced in course of existence. The Oracle will cut through it. Even weird breed of cat like Nazi Germany comprehensible to I Ching. Mr. Baines, seeing Mr. Tagomi distractedly manipulating the handful of vegetable stalks, recognized how deep the man's distress was. For him, Mr. Baines thought, this event, his having had to kill and mutilate these two men, is not only dreadful, it is inexplicable. What can I say that might console him? He fired on my behalf. The moral responsibility for these two lives is therefore mine, and I accept it. I view it that way. Coming over beside Mr. Baines, General Tadeki said in a soft voice, You witness the man's despair. He, you see, was no doubt raised as a Buddhist. Even if not formally, the influence was there, a culture in which no life is to be taken, all lives holy. Mr. Baines nodded. He will recover his equilibrium, General Tadeki continued, in time. Right now he has no standpoint by which he can view and comprehend his act. That book will help him, for it provides an external frame of reference. I see, Mr. Baines said. He thought another frame of reference which might help him would be the doctrine of original sin. I wonder if he has ever heard of it. We are all doomed to commit acts of cruelty or violence or evil. That is our destiny, due to ancient factors, our karma. To save one life, Mr. Tagomi had to take two. The logical, balanced mind cannot make sense of that. A kindly man like Mr. Tagomi could be driven insane by the implications of such reality. Nevertheless, Mr. Baines thought, the crucial point lies not in the present, not in either my death or the death of the two SD men, it lies, hypothetically, in the future. What has happened here is justified or not justified by what happens later. Can we perhaps save the lives of millions, all Japan, in fact? But the man manipulating the vegetable stocks could not think of that. The present, the actuality, was too tangible, the dead and dying Germans on the floor of his office. General Tadeki was right. Time would give Mr. Tagomi perspective. Either that, or he would perhaps retreat into the shadows of mental illness, avert his gaze forever, due to a hopeless perplexity. And we are not really different from him, Mr. Baines thought. We are faced with the same confusions. Therefore, unfortunately, we can give Mr. Tagome no help. We can only wait, hoping that finally he will recover and not succumb. Chapter 13 in Denver, they found chic, modern stores. The clothes, Juliana thought, were numbingly expensive, but Joe did not seem to care or even to notice. He simply paid for what she picked out, and then they hurried on to the next store. Her major acquisition, after much trying on of dresses and much prolonged deliberating and rejecting, occurred late in the day. A light blue Italian original with short, fluffy sleeves and a wildly low neckline. In a European fashion magazine, she had seen a model wearing such a dress, it was considered the finest style of the year, and it cost Joe almost two hundred dollars. To go with it, she needed three pairs of shoes, more nylon stockings, several hats, and a new handmade black leather purse. And, she discovered, the neckline of the Italian dress demanded the new brassiers which covered only the lower part of each breast. Viewing herself in the full-length mirror of the dress shop, she felt overexposed and a little insecure about bending over. But the salesgirl assured her that the new half-bras remained firmly in place, despite their lack of straps. Just up to the nipple, Juliana thought, as she peered at herself in the privacy of the dressing room, and not one millimeter more. The bras, too, cost quite a bit. Also imported, the salesgirl explained, and handmade. 
The sales girl showed her sportswear, too, shorts and bathing suits and a terry cloth beach robe. But all at once Joe became restless, so they went on. As Joe loaded the parcels and bags into the car, she said, Don't you think I'm going to look terrific? Yes, he said in a preoccupied voice. Especially that uh, blue dress. You wear that when we go there, to Abinson's. Understand? He spoke the last word sharply, as if it was an order. The tone surprised her. I'm a size 12 or 14, she said as they entered the next dress shop. The salesgirl smiled graciously and accompanied them to the racks of dresses. What else did she need? Juliana wondered. Better to get as much as possible while she could. Her eyes took in everything at once. The blouses, skirts, sweaters, slacks, coats. Yes, a coat. Joe, she said, I have to have a long coat, but not a cloth coat. They compromised with one of the synthetic fiber coats from Germany. It was more durable than natural fur and less expensive but she felt disappointed. To cheer herself up, she began examining jewelry. But it was dreary costume junk, without imagination or originality. I have to get some jewelry, she explained to Joe. Earrings, at least, or a pin, to go with the blue dress. She led him along the sidewalk to a jewelry store. And your clothes, she remembered with guilt. We have to shop for you, too. While she looked for jewelry, Joe stopped at a barber shop for his haircut. When he appeared a half hour later, she was amazed. He had not only gotten his hair cut as short as possible, but he had had it dyed. She would hardly have recognized him. He was now blonde. Good God, she thought, staring at him. Why? Shrugging, Joe said, I'm a tired of being a wop. That was all he would say. He refused to discuss it as they entered a men's clothing store and began shopping for him. They bought him a nicely tailored suit of one of DuPont's new synthetic fibers, Dacron, and new socks, underwear, and a pair of stylish, sharp-toed shoes. What now, Juliana thought? Shirts and ties. She and the clerk picked out two white shirts with French cuffs, several ties made in France, and a pair of silver cufflinks. It took only forty minutes to do all the shopping for him. She was astonished to find it so easy compared to her own. His suit, she thought, should be altered. But again Joe had become restless. He paid the bill with the Reichsbank notes, which he carried. I know something else, Juliana realized. A new billfold. So she and the clerk picked out a black alligator billfold for him, and that was that. They left the store and returned to the car. It was 4.30, and the shopping, at least as far as Joe was concerned, was over. You don't want the waistline taken in a little? She asked Joe as he drove out into downtown Denver traffic. On your suit? No! His voice, brusque and impersonal, startled her. "'What's wrong? Did I buy too much?' "'I know that's it,' she said to herself. "'I spent too much. "'I could take some of the skirts back. "'Let's eat dinner,' he said. "'Oh, God!' she exclaimed. "'I know what I didn't get. Nightgowns!' He glared at her ferociously. "'Don't you want me to get some nice new pajamas?' she said. So I'll be all fresh and... No, he shook his head. Forget it. Look for a place to eat. Juliana said in a steady voice, We'll go and register at the hotel first, so we can change. Then we'll eat. And it better be a really fine hotel, she thought, or it's all off. Even this late. And we'll ask them at the hotel what's the best place in Denver to eat. And the name of a good nightclub where we can see a once-in-a-lifetime act. Not some local talent, but some big names from Europe, like Eleanor Perez or Willie Beck. I know great UFA stars like that come out to Denver, because I've seen the ads, and I won't settle for anything less. As they searched for a good hotel, Juliana kept glancing at the man beside her. With his hair short and blonde, and in his new clothes, he doesn't look like the same person, she thought. Do I like him better this way? It was hard to tell. And me... When I've been able to arrange for my hair being done, we'll be two different persons, almost. Created out of nothing, or rather out of money. But I just must get my hair done, she told herself. They found a large, stately hotel in downtown Denver with a uniformed doorman who arranged for the car to be parked. That was what she wanted. And a bellboy, actually a grown man, but wearing the maroon uniform, came quickly and carried all their parcels and luggage, leaving them with nothing to do but climb the wide carpeted steps under the awning 
passed through the glass and mahogany doors and into the lobby. Small shops on each side of the lobby, flower shop, gifts, candy, place to telegraph, desk to reserve plane flights, the bustle of guests at the desk in the elevators, the huge potted plants, and under their feet the carpeting, thick and soft. She could smell the hotel, the many people, the activity. Neon signs indicated in which direction the hotel restaurant, cocktail lounge, snack bar lay. She could barely take it all in as they crossed the lobby and at last reached the reservation desk. There was even a bookstore. While Joe signed the register, she excused herself and hurried over to the bookstore to see if they had the grasshopper. Yes, there it was, a bright stack of copies, in fact, with a display sign saying how popular and important it was, and, of course, that it was verboten in German-run regions. A smiling middle-aged woman, very grandmotherly, waited on her. The book cost almost four dollars, which seemed to Juliana a great deal, but she paid for it with a Reichsbank note from her new purse and then skipped back to join Joe. Leading the way with their luggage, the bellboy conducted them to the elevator and then up to the second floor, along the corridor, silent and warm and carpeted, to their superb, breathtaking room. The bellboy unlocked the door for them, carried everything inside, adjusted the window and lights. Joe tipped him, and he departed, shutting the door after him. All was unfolding exactly as she wanted. "'How long will we stay in Denver?' she asked Joe, who had begun opening packages on the bed. "'Before we go on up to Cheyenne.' He did not answer. He had become involved in the contents of his suitcase. "'One day or two, she asked, as she took off her new coat. "'Do you think we could stay three? Lifting his head, Joe answered, "'We're going on tonight.' At first she did not understand, and when she did she could not believe him. She stared at him, and he stared back with a grim, almost taunting expression, his face constricted with enormous tension, more than she had seen in any human in her life before. He did not move. He seemed paralyzed there, with his hands full of his own clothing from the suitcase, his body bent. After we eat, he added. She could not think of anything to say. So wear that blue dress that costs so much, he said. The one you like, the really good one, you understand? Now he began unbuttoning his shirt. I'm going to shave and take a good hot shower. His voice had a mechanical quality, as if he were speaking from miles away through some sort of instrument. Turning, he walked toward the bathroom with stiff, jerky steps. With difficulty, she managed to say, It's too late tonight. No. We'll be through dinner around 5.30, 6 at the latest. We can get up to Cheyenne in two, two and a half hours. That's only 8.30, say 9 at the latest. We can phone from here, tell Abinson we're coming, explain the situation. That'll make an impression, a long-distance call. Say this, we're flying to the West Coast. We're in Denver only tonight. But we're so enthusiastic about this book, we're going to drive up to Cheyenne and drive back again tonight, just for a chance to... She broke in. Why? Tears began to surge up into her eyes, and she found herself doubling up her fists with the thumbs inside as she had done as a child. She felt her jaw wobble, and when she spoke, her voice could hardly be heard. I don't want to go see him tonight. I'm not going. I don't want to at all, even tomorrow. I just want to see the sights here, like you promised me. And as she spoke, the dread once more reappeared and settled on her chest, the peculiar blind panic that had scarcely gone away, even in the brightest of moments with him. It rose to the top and commanded her. She felt it quivering in her face, shining out so that he could easily take note of it. Joe said, We'll buzz up there, and then afterward, when we come back, we'll take in the sights here. He spoke reasonably, and yet still with a stark deadness, as if he were reciting. No, she said. Put on that blue dress. He rummaged around among the parcels until he found it in the largest box. He carefully removed the cord, got out the dress, laid it on the bed with precision. He did not hurry. Okay, you'll be a knockout. Listen, we'll buy a bottle of high-priced scotch and take it along. That VAT-69. Frank, she thought, help me. I'm in something I don't understand. It's much farther, she answered, than you realize. I looked on the map. It'll be real late when we get there, more like eleven or past midnight. He said, Put on the dress, or I'll kill you. 
Closing her eyes, she began to giggle. My training, she thought. It was true after all. Now we'll see. Can he kill me, or can't I pinch a nerve in his back and cripple him for life? But he fought those British commandos. He's gone through this already, many years ago. I know you maybe can throw me, Joe said. Or maybe not. Not throw you, she said. Maim you, permanently. I actually can. I lived out on the West Coast. The Japs taught me up in Seattle. You go on to Cheyenne if you want to and leave me here. Don't try to force me. I'm scared of you, and I'll try. Her voice broke. I'll try to get you so bad if you come at me. Oh, come on, put on the goddamn dress. What's this all about? You must be nuts talking like that about killing and maiming just because I want you to hop in the car after dinner and drive up to the autobahn with me and see this fellow whose book you... A knock at the door. Joe stalked to it and opened it. A uniformed boy in the corridor said, Valet service. Uh, you inquired at the desk, sir? Oh, yes, Joe said, striding to the bed. He gathered up the new white shirts which he had bought and carried them to the bellboy. Can you get to them back in half an hour? Uh, just ironing out the folds, the boy said, examining them. Not cleaning. Uh, yes, I'm sure they can, sir. As Joe shut the door, Juliana said, How did you know a new white shirt can't be worn until it's pressed? He said nothing. He shrugged. I had forgotten, Juliana said. And a woman ought to know. When you take them out of the cellophane, they're all wrinkled. When I was younger, I used to dress up and go out a lot. How did you know the hotel had valet service? I didn't know it. Did you really have your hair cut and dyed? I think your hair always was blonde, and you were wearing a hairpiece. Isn't that so? Again he shrugged. You must be an S.D. man, she said, posing as a WAP truck driver. You never fought in North Africa, did you? You're supposed to come up here to kill Abinson. Isn't that so? I know it is. I guess I'm pretty dumb. She felt dried up, withered. After an interval, Joe said, Sure, I fought in North Africa. Maybe not with Pardee's artillery battery. With the Brandenburgers, he added. Wehrmacht Commando. Infiltrated British HQs. I don't see what difference it makes. We saw plenty of action. And I was at Cairo. I owned the metal and a battlefield citation. Corporal. Is that fountain pen a weapon? He did not answer. A bomb, she realized suddenly, saying it aloud. A booby trap kind of bomb that's wired so it'll explode when someone touches it. No, he said. What you saw is a two-watt transmitter and receiver, so I can keep it in radio contact, in case there's a change of plan. What with the day-by-day -day political situation in Berlin? You check in with them just before you do it, to be sure. He nodded. You're not Italian. You're a German. Swiss. She said, My husband is a Jew. I don't care what your husband is. All I want is for you to put on that dress and fix yourself up so we can go to dinner. Fix your hair somehow. I wish you could have gotten to the hairdressers. Possibly the hotel beauty salon is still open. You could do that while I wait for my shirts and take my shower. How are you going to kill him? Joe said. Please put on the new dress, Juliana. I'll phone down and ask about the hairdresser. He walked over to the room phone. Why do you need me along? Dialing, Joe said. We have a folder on Abinson, and it seems he is attracted to a certain type of dark, libidinous girl, a specific Middle Eastern or Mediterranean type. As he talked to the hotel people, Juliana went over to the bed and lay down. She shut her eyes and put her arm across her face. They do have a hairdresser, Joe said when he had hung up the phone, and she can take care of you right away. You go down to the salon. It's on the mezzanine. He handed her something. Opening her eyes, she saw that it was more Reichbank notes. To pay her. She said, Let me lie here, will you please? He regarded her with a look of acute curiosity and concern. Seattle is like San Francisco would have been, she said, if there had been no great fire. Real old wooden buildings and some brick ones and hilly like SF. The Japs there go back to a long time before the war. 
They have a whole business section and houses, stores and everything, very old. It's a port. This little old Jap who taught me. I had gone up there with a merchant marine guy, and while I was there I started taking these lessons. Minoru Ichoyasu. He wore a vest and tie. He was as round as a yo-yo. He taught upstairs in a Jap office building. He had that old-fashioned gold lettering on his door, and a waiting room like a dentist's office, with National Geographics. Bending over her, Joe took hold of her arm and lifted her to a sitting position. He supported her, propped her up. What's the matter? You act like you're sick. He peered into her face, searching her features. I'm dying, she said. It's just an anxiety attack. Don't you have them all the time? I can get you a sedative from the hotel pharmacy. What about phenobarbital? And they haven't eaten since ten this morning. You'll be all right. When we get to Abinson's, you don't have to do a thing. Only stand there with me. I'll do the talking. Just smile and be companionable with me and him. Stay with him and make conversations with him, so that he stays with us and doesn't go off somewhere. When he sees you, I'm certain he'll let us in, especially with that Italian dress cut as it is. I'd let you in myself, if I were he. Let me go into the bathroom, she said. I'm sick. Please. She struggled loose from him. I'm being sick. Let me go. He let her go, as she made her way across the room and into the bathroom. She shut the door behind her. I can do it, she thought. She snapped the light on. It dazzled her. She squinted. I can find it. In the medicine cabinet, a courtesy pack of razor blades, soap, toothpaste. She opened the fresh little pack of blades. Single edge, yes. Unwrapped the new greasy blue-black blade. Water ran in the shower. She stepped in. Good God, she had on her clothes. Ruined. Her dress clung, hair streaming. Horrified, she stumbled, half fell, groping her way out, water drizzling from her stockings. She began to cry. Joe found her standing by the bowl. She had taken her wet, ruined suit off. She stood naked, supporting herself on one arm, leaning and resting. Jesus Christ, she said to him when she realized he was there. I don't know what to do. My jersey suit is ruined. It's wool. She pointed. He turned to see the heap of sodden clothes. Very calmly, but his face was stricken, he said, Well, you weren't going to wear that anyhow. With a fluffy white hotel towel, he dried her off, led her from the bathroom back to the warm, carpeted main room. Put on your underwear. Get something on. I'll have the hairdresser come up here. She has to. That's all there is. Again he picked up the phone and dialed. What did you get me in the way of pills? she asked when he had finished phoning. I forgot. I'll call down to the pharmacy. No, wait. I have something. Nembutal or some damn thing. Hurrying to his suitcase, he began rummaging. When he held out two yellow capsules to her, she said, Will they destroy me? She accepted them clumsily. What? he said, his face twitching. Rot my lower body, she thought, groin to dry. I mean, she said cautiously, weaken my concentration. No, it's some A.G. Kemi products they give back home. I use them when I can't sleep. I'll get you a glass of water. He ran off. Blade, she thought. I swallowed it. Now cuts my loins forever. Punishment. Married to a Jew and shacking up with a Gestapo assassin. She felt tears again in her eyes, boiling. For all I have committed, wrecked. Let's go, she said, rising to her feet. The hairdresser. You're not dressed. He led her, sat her down, tried to get her underpants onto her without success. I have to get your hair fixed, he said in a despairing voice. Where is that her, that woman? She said, speaking slowly and painstakingly, Hair creates bear who removes spots. In nakedness, hiding no hide to be hung with a hook, the hook from God. Hair, here, her. Pills eating, probably turpentine acid, they all met, decided dangerous, most corrosive solvent to eat me forever. Staring down at her, Joe blanched. Must read into me, she thought. Reads my mind with his machine, although I can't find it. Those pills, she said. Confuse and bewilder. He said, You didn't take them. He pointed to her clenched fist. 
she discovered that she still had them there. "'You're mentally ill,' he said. He had become heavy, slow, like some inert mass. "'You are very sick. We can't go.' "'No, doctor,' she said. "'I'll be okay.' She tried to smile. She watched his face to see if she had. Reflection from his brain caught my thoughts in rots. "'I can't take you to the Abinsons,' he said. "'Not now, anyway. Tomorrow. Maybe you'll be better. We'll try tomorrow. They have to.' "'May I go to the bathroom again?' He nodded, his face working, barely hearing her. So she returned to the bathroom. Again she shut the door. In the cabinet, another blade, which she took in her right hand. She came out once more. "'Bye-bye,' she said. As she opened the corridor door, he exclaimed, grabbed wildly at her. "'Whisk!' "'It is awful,' she said. "'They violate. I ought to know.' Ready for purse snatcher, the various night prowlers I can certainly handle. Where had this one gone? Slapping his neck, doing a dance. "'Let me by,' she said. "'Don't bar my way unless you want a lesson. However, only women.' Holding the blade up, she went on opening the door. Joe sat on the floor, hands pressed to the side of his throat, sunburned posture. Goodbye, she said, and shut the door behind her, the warm carpeted corridor. A woman in a white smock, humming or singing, wheeled a cart along, head down, gawked at door numbers, arrived in front of Juliana. The woman lifted her head, and her eyes popped and her mouth fell. Oh, sweetie, she said. You really are tight. You need a lot more than a hairdresser. You go right back inside your room and get your clothes on before they throw you out of this hotel. My good Lord! She opened the door behind Juliana. Have your man sober you up. I'll have room service send up hot coffee. Please, now, get into your room. Pushing Juliana back into the room, the woman slammed the door after her and the sound of her cart diminished. Hairdresser lady, Juliana realized. Looking down, she saw that she did have nothing on. The woman had been correct. Joe, she said, they won't let me. She found the bed, found her suitcase, opened it, spilled out clothes, underwear, then blouse and skirt, pair of low-heeled shoes. Made me come back, she said. Finding a comb, she rapidly combed her hair, then brushed it. What an experience! That woman was right outside, about to knock. Rising, she went to find the mirror. Is this better? Mirror in the closet door. Turning, she surveyed herself, twisting, standing on tiptoe. I'm so embarrassed, she said, glancing around for him. I hardly know what I'm doing. You must have given me something. Whatever it was, it just made me sick, instead of helping me. Still sitting on the floor, clasping the side of his neck, Joe said, Listen, you're very good. You cut my aorta, artery in my neck. Giggling, she clapped her hand to her mouth. Oh, God, you're such a freak. I mean, you get words all wrong. The aorta's in your chest. You mean the carotid. If I let go, he said, I'll bleed out in two minutes. You know that, so get me some kind of help. Get a doctor or an ambulance. You understand me? Did you mean to? Evidently. Okay, you call or go get someone? After pondering, she said, I meant to. Well, he said, anyhow, get them for me. For my sake. Go yourself. I don't have it completely closed. Blood had seeped through his fingers, she saw, down his wrist, pool on the floor. I don't dare move. I have to stay here. She put on her new coat, closed her new handmade leather purse, picked up her suitcase and as many of the parcels which were hers as she could manage. In particular, she made sure she took the big box and the blue Italian dress tucked carefully in it. As she opened the corridor door, she looked back at him. Maybe I can tell them at the desk, she said. Downstairs. Yes, he said. All right, she said. I'll tell them. Don't look for me back at the apartment in Cannon City, because I'm not going back there. And I have most of those Reichsbank notes, so I'm in good shape in spite of everything. Goodbye. I'm sorry. 
She shut the door and hurried along the hall as fast as she could manage, lugging the suitcase and parcels. At the elevator, an elderly, well-dressed businessman and his wife helped her. They took the parcels for her, and downstairs in the lobby they gave them to a bellboy for her. Thank you, Juliana said to them. After the bellboy had carried her suitcase and parcels across the lobby and out onto the front sidewalk, she found a hotel employee who could explain to her how to get back her car. Soon she was standing in the cold concrete garage beneath the hotel, waiting while the attendant brought the Studebaker around. In her purse she found all kinds of change. She tipped the attendant, and the next she knew she was driving up a yellow-lit ramp and onto the dark street, with its headlights, cars, advertising neon signs. The uniformed doorman of the hotel personally loaded her luggage and parcels into the trunk for her, smiling with such hearty encouragement that she gave him an enormous tip before she drove away. No one tried to stop her, and that amazed her. They did not even raise an eyebrow. I guess they know he'll pay, she decided. Or maybe he already did, when he registered for us. While she waited with other cars for a streetlight to change, she remembered that she had not told them at the desk about Joe sitting on the floor of the room, needing the doctor. Still waiting up there, waiting from now on until the end of the world, or until the cleaning women showed up tomorrow sometime, i better go back, she decided, or telephone, stop at a payphone booth. It's so silly, she thought as she drove along, searching for a place to park and telephone. Who would have thought an hour ago, when we signed in, when we shopped? We almost went on, got dressed up, and went out to dinner. We might even have gotten out to the nightclub. Again she had begun to cry, she discovered. Tears dripped from her nose onto her blouse as she drove. Too bad I didn't consult the oracle. It would have known and warned me. Why didn't I? Any time I could have asked, any place along the trip, or even before we left. She began to moan involuntarily. The noise, a howling she had never heard issue out of her before, horrified her, but she could not suppress it even though she clamped her teeth together. A ghastly chanting, singing, wailing, rising up through her nose. When she had parked, she sat with the motor running, shivering, hands in her coat pockets. Christ, she said to herself miserably. Well, I guess that's the sort of thing that happens. She got out of the car and dragged her suitcase from the trunk. In the back seat, she opened it and dug around among the clothes and shoes until she had hold of the two black volumes of the Oracle. There, in the back seat of the car, with the motor running, she began tossing three RMS dimes, using the glare of a department store window to see by. What'll I do? she asked it. Tell me what to do, please. Hexagram 42 increase, with moving lines in the second, third, fourth, and top places, therefore changing to hexagram 43, breakthrough. She scanned the text ravenously, catching up the successive stages of meaning in her mind, gathering it and comprehending. Jesus, it depicted the situation exactly, a miracle once more. All that had happened there before her eyes, blueprint, schematic. It furthers one to undertake something. It furthers one to cross the great water. Trip, to go and do something important, not stay here. Now the lines. Her lips moved, seeking. Ten pairs of tortoises cannot oppose him. Constant perseverance brings good fortune. The king presents him before God. Now six in the third. Reading, she became dizzy. One is enriched through unfortunate events. No blame if you are sincere, and walk in the middle, and report with a seal to the prince. The prince? It meant Abinson. The seal, the new copy of his book. Unfortunate events. The oracle knew what had happened to her, the dreadfulness with Joe, or whatever he was. She read six in the fourth place. If you walk in the middle, and report to the prince, he will follow. I must go there, she realized even if Joe comes after me. She devoured the last moving line, nine at the top. He brings increase to no one. Indeed, someone even strikes him. He does not keep his heart constantly steady. Misfortune. Oh, God, she thought. It means the killer, the Gestapo people. It's telling me that Joe or someone like him, someone else, will get there and kill Abinson. Quickly she turned to hexagram 43, the judgment. One must resolutely make the matter known at the court of the king. It must be announced truthfully. Danger. 
it is necessary to notify one's own city. It does not further to resort to arms. It furthers one to undertake something. So it's no use to go back to the hotel and make sure about him. It's hopeless, because there will be others sent out. Again, the oracle says, even more emphatically, get up to Cheyenne and warn Abinson, however dangerous it is to me. I must bring him the truth. She shut the volume. Getting back behind the wheel of the car, she backed out into traffic. In a short time, she had found her way out of downtown Denver and onto the main autobahn going north. She drove as fast as the car would go, the engine making a strange throbbing noise that shook the wheel and the seat and made everything in the glove compartment rattle. Thank God for Dr. Tot and his autobahns, she said to herself as she hurtled along through the darkness, seeing only her own headlights and the lines marking the lanes. At ten o'clock that night, because of tire trouble, she had still not reached Cheyenne, so there was nothing to do but pull off the road and search for a place to spend the night. An autobahn exit sign ahead of her read, Greeley, five miles. I'll start out again tomorrow morning, she told herself, as she drove slowly along the main street of Greeley a few minutes later. She saw several motels with vacancy signs lit, so there was no problem. What I must do, she decided, is call Abinson tonight and say I'm coming. When she had parked, she got wearily from the car, relieved to be able to stretch her legs, all day on the road from eight in the morning on. An all-night drugstore could be made out not far down the sidewalk. Hands in the pockets of her coat, she walked that way, and soon she was shut up in the privacy of the phone booth, asking the operator for Cheyenne information. Their phone, thank God, was listed. She put in the quarters, and the operator rang. Hello? A woman's voice sounded presently, a vigorous, rather pleasant younger woman's voice, a woman no doubt about her own age. Mrs. Abinson? Juliana said. May I talk to Mr. Abinson? Who is this, please? Juliana said, I read his book, and I drove all day up from Cannon City, Colorado. I'm in Greeley now. I thought I could make it to your place tonight, but I can't, so I want to know if I can see him sometime tomorrow. After a pause, Mrs. Abinson said in a still pleasant voice, Yes, it's too late now. We go to bed quite early. Was there any special reason why you wanted to see my husband? He's working very hard right now. I wanted to speak to him, she said. Her own voice in her ears sounded drab and wooden. She stared at the wall of the booth, unable to find anything further to say. Her body ached and her mouth felt dry and full of foul tastes. Beyond the phone booth, she could see the druggist at the soda counter serving milkshakes to four teenagers. She longed to be there. She scarcely paid attention as Mrs. Abinson answered. She longed for some fresh, cold drink and something like a chicken salad sandwich to go with it. Hawthorne works erratically, Mrs. Abinson was saying in her merry, brisk voice. If you drive up here tomorrow, I can't promise you anything, because he might be involved all day long. But if you understand that before you make the trip... Yes, she broke in. I know he'll be glad to chat with you for a few minutes if he can, Mrs. Abinson continued. But please don't be disappointed if by chance he can't break off long enough to talk to you or even see you. We read his book and liked it. Juliana said. I have it with me. I see, Mrs. Abinson said good-naturedly. We stopped off at Denver and shopped, so we lost a lot of time. No, she thought. It's all changed, all different. Listen, she said. The oracle told me to come to Cheyenne. Oh, my, Mrs. Abinson said, sounding as if she knew about the oracle, and yet not taking the situation seriously. I'll give you the lines. She had brought the oracle with her into the phone booth. Propping the volumes up on the shelf beneath the phone, she laboriously turned the pages. Just a second. She located the page and read first the judgment, and then the lines to Mrs. Abinson. When she got to the nine at the top, the line about someone striking him and misfortune, she heard Mrs. Abinson exclaim, Pardon? Juliana said, pausing. Go ahead. Mrs. Abinson said. Her tone, Juliana thought, had a more alert, sharpened quality now. After Juliana had read the judgment of the 43rd hexagram, with the word danger in it, there was silence. Mrs. Abinson said nothing, and Juliana said nothing. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow, then, Mrs. Abinson said finally. And would you give me your name, please? 
Juliana Frink, she said. Thank you very much, Mrs. Abinson. The operator now had broken into clamor about the time being up, so Juliana hung up the phone, collected her purse and the volumes of the Oracle, left the phone booth, and walked over to the drugstore fountain. After she had ordered a sandwich and a Coke, and was sitting smoking a cigarette and resting, she realized with a rush of unbelieving horror that she had said nothing to Mrs. Abinson about the Gestapo man or the SD man or whatever he was, that Joe Cinadella she had left in the hotel room in Denver. She simply could not believe it. I forgot, she said to herself. It dropped completely out of my mind. How could that be? I must be nuts. I must be terribly sick and stupid and nuts. For a moment she fumbled with her purse, trying to find change for another call. No, she decided as she started up from the stool. I can't call them again tonight. I'll let it go. It's just too goddamn late. I'm tired, and they're probably asleep by now. She ate her chicken salad sandwich, drank her Coke, and then she drove to the nearest motel, rented a room, and crept tremblingly into bed. Context of white supremacy. Uh, so this is our second to last session. We have our second session today, and then we'll only have one audio for next week, all done, pushing off to a new book. So let's see. The number, uh, if you have commentary to share, 720-716-7300. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star six one if you would like to participate. We actually finished at the conclusion of chapter 13, so we'll start our second audio segment. will be the very beginning of chapter 14. Bravo. The number again is 720-716-7300. The code 564 Nine four three pound. Press star six one if you would like to participate. Email is until justice at gmail dot com. Before I get to some of the emails that folks sent in, one thing I do want to say, like man, I'm glad to be moving on from this book because we've had uh practically zero uh engagement from listeners from the very beginning even though a cavalcade of listeners voted to read this book and as i predicted many of them because it was on tv anywho uh despite the lack of engagement and i think i cannot understate like some movies some TV shows, right, are not just super easy, uh, you know, whodunit or explosions and chases and that sort of thing. Like some movies, right, you have to watch a couple times to really grasp everything that you saw, right? We've seen movies like that, Inception and some other films, like you might have to watch it a time or two to really catch everything. Some books are like that. I think I said last week, so in this book you have Japanese, you have German, you have English, you have broken English. All of that comes in. I've had to look up Japanese words. I've had to look up German. Uh, I've had to try to make sense of why are some of the white characters speaking broken English some of them are not. Now, why is that? There's so much to process. You got people lying and spies and all the rest of it. It is not, in addition to the alternate universe and all the rest of it, this is not an easy book. I even looked at uh, one of the study guides. It had a rating for difficulty of reading. This book is substantially more difficult than you know most other books that you would read and they have lots of different points of view like sometimes you're kind of going through it from Ju uh, Juliana's perspective sometimes it's children's perspective sometimes it's uh, Frank Fink's perspective like 
all of that as opposed to just going through with one person like star in the hate you gave or something similar lots of reasons why this is a more challenging book but why and just some things mr fuller he says hiding in plain sight like just look at the title the man in the high castle Again, Philip Dick was kicking it with the Black Panthers and also I'm pretty sure in the 1960s in Bay Area, California, he knew the phrase, the man. I think some of us may have heard I think it's familiar. How does that how does that victim say it? A victim who says that he's retarded. How does he say it? He says that the system of white supremacy is like a royalist system he says he says that racist man racist woman like to be up high in a skyscraper or a castle so they can look down on the negros splash mud on them somebody somebody said that that should be familiar to some people and the man in the high castle. Isn't that a Welsing moment? The man. Lots of different things that we could have discussed, but apparently reading, saying reading is more important than watching television is cooler than putting that into practice. At least for this book that you all wanted to read. Some of the folks, at least one person, we really only had one person who voted for this book, who championship deans list A pluses across the board. Uh, she uh, didn't call, but she wrote in consistently. Uh, let's see. One of our investors, she wrote in and also in the Pacific Northwest. How about that? I finally got done reading the book and I found the ending. At, now, see, we didn't get to the, the uh, ending, so I hope there's no spoilers here. Uh, I want to share my thoughts about this week's segment, but I still have some thoughts about last week's that I'd like to address before I do so. I went back to chapter 11 when Childan goes to Paul Kasura's office. A couple of things seemed odd to me. First, the use of the term graft by Childan in describing his giving the pin to Paul for his wife, Betty. That was weird. I understood graft to have different meanings than this. The first one is to join two or more plants into one or to join any living tissue onto an organism like a skin graft. Then there's another usage meaning the acquisition of gains such as money in a dishonest or questionable way. I think this is closer to what the author meant but I can't really say and old Philip K. Dick isn't around to explain. Maybe it was supposed to be Freudian slip on the part of Chill Dan, or maybe there used to be another meaning to graft. I don't have any dictionaries from the 1950s or 60s to confirm this. My questioning the meaning of words is making me think of 1984 by George Orwell. We did read that in the book club. Ten years. Uh, there's a lot of the use of this term graft uh, in the book, I noted it some time ago. It seems uh, many, many people are grafting gifts, and I totally think it's that first uh, definition in some sort of uh, used, uh, some sort of resource. It can be money or it can be gifts. That's what a lot of it's been in this book, gifts uh, in some sort of dishonest way. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think this is an older, I don't think people generally use the term graft as frequently. I think this is very much a uh, kind of antiquated term uh, from like the 60s, maybe. Uh, people still do this. It's still illegal. I'm trying to think of what they would call this now. Um, bribery? Fraud? I think that's just what they would call it now. Bribery or fraud could be something else and either way um, but, it, but it's an older term uh, but I think it's that second definition doing something to curry favor because that's a lot of what children is doing trying to curry favor uh, with those in power uh, by giving these gifts so I think it's the, the second definition and let's just see how many times is the word graft 
used in the in the book. Let's see. Graft. Seven times, so not tons, but I mean that's a good number of uh times. And let's see how let's see. The first time we hear it is therefore we will cater to his prejudice and graft a priceless American artifact to him instead. See, that's that it's totally that second definition, trying to carry favor with someone generally in a dishonest way, political scheme type of a thing. Uh continuing. Page one and three, your wife was disappointed by my crude gift I possibly insulted. However, with something new and untried, as I explained to you, when I grafted it to you, no proper or final evaluation can be made, at least not by someone in the purely business end. 186, a high-placed Japanese lauding to the skies, a gift grafted to him and then returning it. Oh, this is from last week. Also, Paul saw the pen was special. I took him a while, but he was able to perceive this, and later, with the triangle, Mr. Tagomi is able to perceive whatever paranormal quality that the piece has. Why are the so-called Japanese able to see this, and the white people can't? Good question. I think that comes up irregularly in the uh, in the book. Paul says on 184, I have for several days now inspected it, and for no logical reason, logical, I feel a certain emotional fondness why is that i do not even now project into this blob as in psychological german tests my own psyche i still see no shapes or forms you see it is balanced Mm, the forces within this piece are stabilized at rest so to speak this object has made its peace with the universe it has separated from it and hence has managed to come to homeostasis it is complete robert by contemplating it we gain more woo ourselves we experience the tranquility associated not with art but with holy things this is alive in the now to have no historicity and also no artistic aesthetic worth and yet to partake of some ethereal value that is a marvel in other words an entire new world is pointed to by this the name for it is neither art for it has no form no religion what is it i have pondered this pen unceasingly yet cannot fathom it we evidently lack the word for an object like this it is authentically a new thing on the face of the world all the things that paul Cossor said about this pen should have let robert children know that he was in the presence of something incredibly unique and powerful but it was like he couldn't even begin to grasp what Paul was saying. Now that happens a few times when Paul is talking to him about the Negro music and some other things that might seem beyond logic of a spiritual nature, emotional, what have you, uh, where it seems like he can't really understand. In fact, Paul, or excuse me, Child then references himself as a barbarian when this keeps happening during their first dinner engagement. Uh, let's see. That's left out of the sound clip that we heard today. See, she continues. Mr. Kasura had thought so deeply on this pen, its meaning and place in the universe held a high level of significance for me. And I think for the story, Paul spent so much time explaining the rarity and value of this object. And then he returned it to him. I think he did this because he thought it would have been taking advantage of children's ignorance to keep it. He perceived correctly that Robert Children had no idea of the worth of this object when he gave it as a so-called gift to him for his wife, Betty. So I think he felt duty bound to return the object and try his best to make Robert Childan understand its worth. But Childan just did not get it. It is possible that the imbalance of Childan made it difficult to perceive the balance of the object. Question. Now, all of that, I think, brilliant, totally logical, and it fits within everything that we've read in the story. I think last week some people did raise a question, maybe uh, other listener who wrote in, was Paul Kasura manipulating Childan because he wants him to make these cheap uh, trinkets out of his jewelry and do it with one of his business partners. So was he doing all this to manipulate him into business? That was a thought, too. But everything that she says makes total sense about Childan being maybe uh, out of balance to perceive the beauty in his own uh, work here. Continuing. 
crackpot neurotic Japanese worldview. Children thinks on page 187 and they're out of their minds. Our lines are used to illustrate that Childan thinks Paul and Japanese people as a whole are crazy, which is said a few times in the book. Fortunately, long habit had caused Childan to suppress any show of authentic feelings automatically. That sentence is interesting to me. It shows that for this white man, deception, omission is the default. He assumed a bland, sober expression persona that correctly matched the nature of the situation. He could sense it there, the mask. In my opinion, it says a lot that he thinks of his face as a mask, something used to conceal true identity, to disguise oneself, and to confuse others. I personally wish a significant number of whites would let their masks slip so non-whites collectively could start to see and understand what we're really dealing with. Incidentally, I do think some of this masking here, it's totally white people being deceptive and all, but I also think some of that is the condition of being subject uh, where France, or excuse me, not Paul Lawrence Dunbar talks about we wear the mask. I think that's and phew, this white man, he's been hanging out with the Black Panthers and what have you. I would take the wager that he probably knows Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the mask. So I think he might even be what they call signifying on that, that that would be white people if they're in a position of domination, subjugation, that they would have to also wear the mask, especially still being committed to racism, that they can't just be so blatant about it. So they would have to, as we heard in the opening clip, uh, grafting all of these gifts and pretending, oh, I'm not racist. Oh, I love you all. And I love your house. Feel the wabi. Mm. That's one of my favorite lines. I say that all the li- uh, all the time. They're like, mm, I sense the wabi. Mm. Let's see. Uh, chapter 12 where we left off oh boy I was borderline pleased with the way Mr. Tagomi handled himself with the Germans finally got upstairs I guess all that practicing paid off I think that was one of the pistols that was made in the place that Ed and Frank worked for Mm -hmm. I say this because a pistol that was actually from the Civil War might not have fired but a pistol that was just manufactured and only made to look old would probably work just fine the text didn't clarify but that's what I think I said that before like as soon as they mentioned this pistol I was like hmm I bet that's probably a fake I think Philip K. Dick would want you to think that and uh, a theme for the book even though some things are fraudulent they can be dangerous even deadly case in point Page 210, Mr. Tagomi engaged in tedious three minute task of reloading, paused to press the button of the desk intercom. Bring medical emergency aid, he instructed. Hideously injured thug here. This might be the first time ever hearing a white person referred to as a thug. Reference the 10 stops. I know uh, stop killing is on the list, but this seemed to be self-defense, counter violence. I do think all life is precious and no person should be mistreated, but at the same time, white supremacy breeds opposition to white supremacy. Non-justice breeds opposition to non-justice. On page 211, after Mr. Tagomi has killed the people who tried to take over the Nippon Times building, the things that Mr. Dick wrote were pretty interesting whole situation confusing and anomalous he decided no human intelligence could decipher it i think human in this sentence meant hue man colored not white because a white german mr baines could and did decipher it german totalitarian society resembles some faulty form of life worse than natural thing see Philip K. Dick is making it clear he doesn't think white people are natural. While Mr. Tagomi is distraught about killing Mr. Baines, is thinking we're all doomed to commit acts of cruelty or violence or evil. That is our destiny due to ancient factors. Our karma, there's, oh, I hate that word. Philip K. Dick makes it plain. White people do not think or act like non-white people. Yeah death making does not seem to bother them it seems to be in their nature the author even says it's their (laughs) destiny I mentioned when we first started out I said man this book reminds me of all the other like major white sci-fi books and films 
uh, that we've talked about. And one of the principal ones I said that came out at the exact same time, these books were published within two years of each other, Planet of the Apes. And that is one of the main lines at the end of the first one. And that's the beginning of the second one. It is your destiny. Blow up the whole world to maintain white supremacy racism. Violence. Killing. And they're talking about the exact same thing when that line is used, because when it said in Planet of the Apes, the destiny of Charlton Heston is to find out, wow, white people blew up the whole world. Oh, my God. Nuclear weaponry. Your destiny. Blow up the whole world. That's what we do. Kill on a mass level. Africa. Wipe out all the non-white people. Genocide. Let's see. Therefore, unfortunately, we can give Mr. Tagomi no help. We only wait. Mr. Baines thinks whites frequently act as if they can't do anything to help non-white people, when in reality, they could just stop practicing racism. That would help a lot. I think it's easy to get confused by Mr. Baines because it seems he's giving non-white people constructive information. But I don't think we should forget that this white man is a Nazi. A Nazi. Is it possible for a racist to help a non-white person? Yes, it is possible for a Nazi to do something nice for a Jew. Yes, but at the end of the day, he's still a Nazi, a white man, and he's still practicing racism. Even a Nazi can be refined. When Mr. Tagomi gets the silver triangle from Childan. Oh, oh, oh. Don't think we got that far. We will have to come back to that. Pause right there. Uh, let's see. See if some of the folks who dialed in have commentary. They're hanging out, spectating, as I thought. Whew. Let's see. We'll see some of the other uh, 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 notes really quick from this week. Whew. We'll be so thankful to be done with this book. Like, I generally, when I pick books for the program, I try to pick books, number one, that I'm interested and excited to read, and then books that I think also will engage folks. I I do think I distinctly remember thinking Cow's listeners would not be engaged in a book like this. One that that easy. Uh, And I can't emphasize... This is the sort of book you cannot be like, like sometimes like reading is more important than watching television. Okay. What that means is to really read and get a high level of comprehension for some books. You need the book. Yurugu, ISIS papers, whatever. You're not going to just be able to like casually listen Uh, for every cow's book club that we do. Yes, I'm listening, but I have the book in front of me so that I can follow along and highlight and take notes. This is the sort of book you would have to really focus on and pay attention to to even make sense of that. Like, why are some of the white characters speaking broken English? Some of them are not. Why is that? To process, you would have, I think you would have to see it. Like, you can hear it, but I mean, to really be able to look at it makes a huge difference. Uh, and yeah. For reading to be more important than watching television, it would have to be like, commit, I'm going to be serious about this, and crack open that their book, read along, highlight. Even some of the folks who said that they substituted, they were somewhat interested in the book, right? But they were not that interested because they went and watched a TV show. I never watch television with a highlighter. I always highlight even the few times when I'm reading for pleasure even the rare occasions when I'm reading fiction like now I always highlight when I read working your brain computer all right so the man in the high castle my notes from the first section even that, like people, like really, you all could have just thought about that, like, hmm, what is he communicating with it? Because that's the title. And in fact, if you look at some of the books in terms of the cover artwork, some of the cover artwork 
it has the man, and that's one line, the next line in the high castle or whatever, but I mean that's the top line, the man. The man. Let's see. From this week. So we picked up at kind of the end of chapter 12, just before the shootout. Okay, here we go. A lot of, like, direct identification of white people. Um, That just really stood out to me this week. Uh, They had the section where Frank... Frank is arrested and they make a point of saying that it was a middle aged white man who sauntered up to him to arrest him Uh, all the black people are slaves so I'm not sure why it had to be pointed out that directly but that very direct in letting us know that we have individuals classified as white doing the arresting Uh, let's see (laughs) I already made a point thugs Uh, during the uh, Nazi assault on the Times Nippon building uh, operating through official channels is highly efficient. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, down below us, black shirt hooligans are busy clubbing secretaries and clerks. Black shirt hooligans, like dang, even in this environment, black get back, vile. Um, and then white people being called thugs and who now both times it was the Germans. So I guess you know everybody can you know talk bad about Nazis. Um, And then them clubbing secretaries and clerks at this time, it it may have been exclusively white female secretaries or at least female secretaries. So like, wow, these are savages. Uh, Let's see. (laughs) When Tagomi is trying to call to figure out what's happening with this attack to see if he can get some help and stop all of this. And the Germans are kind of giving him the runaround on the phone. He calls one of them. They say, oh, yes, sir. A moment, if you will. A long moment. Then no sound at all on the phone. Not even clicks. He is merely standing there with it. Mr. Takomi decided stalling through typical Nordic wile like Bravo. Pretty well written. Uh, Mr. Dick, I might even use that. Nordic racist a while. This seems like something that we might have experienced on neutralizing workplace racism. Racists pretend to transfer you on the phone and they just hold the line. And this is like life and death. You got people coming in trying to kill you and, you know, they're messing around on the phone giggling and stuff. Nordic wild. Uh, let's see. Not a bad book. Just. Gus was not disgusted about this book being bad. It is not a bad book. In fact, it might even be on Gus's top 10. Uh, You know, I'd have to think about that once we get to the end, but it's definitely not a bad book. Lots to think about. Reveals a lot about white supremacy racism. Gus was just disgruntled that we had poor participation after people voted to read this book. Let's see. More of the notes that I took. Again, they made it so explicit. So after Tagomi kills these two Germans who burst in, uh, and he says, and not German nationals, Mr. Bain said, he had taken the wallet of one of the whites, the dead one. Uh, And then they go through this whole thing that they had, I guess, made sure to make sure that this attack wouldn't be thought of as political, that these are just some random white thugs who did this, and this was not some uh, German state-enforced official act right Uh, because we don't want to provoke war Uh, but again white okay got it Uh, being specific love it Uh, let's see even this talking about the difference between the white people and non-white people they talk about how Takomi just seems like he is totally about to have a breakdown which seems to be the case repeatedly throughout the text he's having like panic attacks and uh, they're at the meeting talking about the new German chancellor and he has to run out and is, you know, oh my gosh, I got sick and lost face in front of everyone. Uh, that's, you know, his character throughout the book. So here he's about to lose it. Like, oh my God, I shot this guy's teeth everywhere and his jaw. And, oh, I had to kill two of them and, oh, two white people. Uh, and it says, uh, Tadeki says he was raised a Buddhist. Uh, event, even if not formally, the influence was there, a culture, a culture in which no life is to be taken, all lives holy. Now again, uh, I think Philip K. Dick kind of presents this dichotomy in the book, the Asian people being not about all this logic and everything that their spirituality and woo, Paul Segura talk, Kasura talking about the jewelry and what have you, and uh, the I Ching 
uh, that is kind of consistent throughout the book, uh, that the non-white people, Asian people specifically, uh, are more spiritual and not into all of this uh, rigid killing uh, enforcement and regime uh, that they even a little bit more benevolent. But I mean, hey, uh, so-called non-white people mistreat a lot of non-white people, even so-called Japanese individuals. I mean, man. Uh, let's see. Even something about that is kind of racist uh, in having Mr. Uh, Tagomi all broken up about this. Kind of same thing as the the uh, gentle Native American type of trope. I could be wrong in that. Let me know. Frail Asian male type of he's not manly like the Germans and some of these other. Even Juliana, you know, she kills Joe and doesn't even think about it. Like, I forgot all about it. I killed him and, you know, all about my business going to visit uh, Abinson. Abin- hope I'm saying it correct. Hawthorne Abinson. Uh, let's see next one thing when they since I just mentioned her Juliana and Joe when they go on their shopping trip uh, en route to go see Abinson the author of the grasshopper lies heavy important for the text they go on this big shopping spree and she's they give all the details about everything that they get and new brassiers and this you know low neckline dress and blue dress and all this and they spend all this money how different is this from you know what we would have anyway I guess if you updated it now they could just do all this you know online uh, and have all the stuff delivered and all the rest but I mean it's not like things are that if they have television space travel cars how are things that different from the US winning I think that is like a major thing people try to suggest uh, in terms of you know how different are things from this book really than from what we actually have? Certainly from the Negro perspective is slavery in the man in the high castle and it's slavery in the real world, even 2022. So the man, let's see. Thought it was interesting when she's talking about the costume junk jewelry. Uh, now we just had this big long scene about the woo in the jewelry that uh, children presents that he got from Ed uh, McCarthy and Frank Frank uh, and how it's got this woo and the spiritual quality and all that and and, and children excuse me Frank Fink wanted to give his ex-wife Juliana a piece of the jewelry didn't know where she was he's trying to get it to her and then she comes and gets this dreary costume junk without imagination or originality hmm uh, let's see. You know, Gus T was over the moon. I did say this book was encroaching on top 10. Like, man, he, uh, Juliana starts talking about how she learned. She says, uh, this is when she finds out, oh, wait a minute. This guy Joe is a spy. He's doing all this to go kill this guy. Like, oh my God, what is going on? Uh, so she is telling him like, Hey, I'm trained in judo. If you watch the TV show, this is all like really dramatic. Her judo training. Incidentally, she is the master judo practitioner in a room full of Asian males, but she is the best white supremacy racism. Thank God. That's that's why I said like the television show is ridiculous. I couldn't sit through like more than three episodes. I haven't even watched three episodes. Um, but Juliana, she says, uh, I could throw you, maim you permanently. I actually can. I lived out on the West Coast. The Japs taught me up in Seattle. You go on to Cheyenne if you want. Leave me here. Don't try to force me. I'm scared of you, and I'll try. Uh, I think she got one more Seattle in there. I thought it was one more, but ah, I was over the moon. Gotta love Seattle. Uh, Let's see. And she's figuring it out. Like, yeah, how did you know they had a valet service here? You always knew. You're a spy, a whole figure. That's why I said it's a lot of things to keep track of. You know, we don't read fiction, so I mean, have to follow all these goofy characters and how many different people align because you got Baines as a spy and this guy's a spy, so you got all this lying, deception to kind of keep track of and very difficult book. Not a book that you can read casually. You would really have to dig in to appreciate everything in The Man in the High Castle. Uh, let's see. He says Abinson, he has a, a thing for dark 
libidinous girls. Like, what in the world? Libidinous mean you're, you know, sexually active, fertile. Uh, like, what in the world? And then dark? Mmm. Bowsing moment, kind of. Uh, oh, and we did. I thought it was like, I thought we had two Seattle where we did. Seattle is like San Francisco would have been, she said, if there had been no great fire. Reeled old wooden buildings and some brick ones and hilly like San Francisco. Amen. They are both super hilly. The Japs there go back to a long time before the war. Oh, that's true. They have a whole business section and houses. Yes. Stores and everything. Yes. Very old. It's a port. Yep. A li- this little old Jap who <laughs> taught me. I had gone up there with a merchant marine guy, and while I was there, I started taking these lessons. Minoru Ukoyasu. He wore a vest and tie. He was as round as a yo-yo. He taught me upstairs in a Jap office building. He had that old-fashioned gold lettering on his door and a waiting room like a dentist's office with National Geographics. Wowzers. Gotta love Seattle and accurate with the detail that she's giving about uh, Gus T's location. Um, the highways in the states have been renamed the Autobahn. And again, there she talks about once they get to Colorado, uh, they do all the shopping and what have you. And they see a group of teenagers. They're out getting milkshades and doing it up at the drugstore. Like, how is this any different from what things would be if or from the U.S. winning the war. I think that is something I think Dick wants us to think about. Like, is this really different from what we have now? Uh, Let's see. Folks are spectating. I will get to our other email, at least read the first portion of it, so we'll be current with where we are. And then we will push off to the second audio segment. Uh, Let's see. A different investor wrote in. uh, Chapter 12. At his desk... Mr. Tagomi pointed his Colt 44 ancient collector's item and compressed the trigger. One of the SD men fell to the floor. The other whipped his silencer-equipped gun toward Mr. Tagomi and returned fire. This scene seems a little absurd. He is able to hold off these Nazi agents with an antique gun. Maybe it's not an antique. Hmm. <laughs> Number two, they will deny complicity, Mr. Bain said. Standard technique used countless times. He laid the silencer-equipped pistol on Mr. Tagomi's desk. Made in Japan. He was not joking. It was true. Excellent quality Japanese target pistol. The author injecting a bit of humor since during the 1960s, Japanese imports into the U.S. were not considered of high quality. How about that? Wonder why? Hmm, Hiroshima? Hmm. Uh, number three, I guess things would be drastically different, right? Uh, number three, nevertheless, Mr. Baines thought the crucial point lies not in the present, not in either my death or the death of the two SD men. It lies hypothetically in the future. What has happened here is justified or not justified by what happens later. Can we perhaps save the lives of millions, all Japan, in fact? It seems as if the Japanese are the only ones who show concern regarding the morality of their actions. For example, Childan was not so much concerned about the morality of selling cheap products, but that he felt personally insulted. Good point. Our previous uh, investor who wrote in said the same thing about the morality that is displayed by the non-white characters, Japanese characters. Uh, Chapter 13. Number one, she paid for it with a rice bank note from her new purse and then skipped back to join Joe. Even in the so-called uncontrolled land, the Nazis exert control. They're using rice bank notes, not the yen. Important point. Uh, Seattle is like San Francisco. The Japs there go back to a long time. I just read that. I can skip all that. Uh, interesting little racist soliloquy by Juliana, ending with a reference to National Geographic, the U.S. magazine, which made a public apology for decades of what they call racist coverage in 2018. I was thinking the same thing. Like, they're just known for, like, monkeys in Africa and bones in their nose. Like, that's, you know, chink. I would love to go back and see what National Geographic's coverage was like during World War II. Like, please. Uh, let's see. Number four. 
Let me buy, she said. Don't bar my way unless you want a lesson. However, only women. Holding the blade up, she went on opening the door. Joe sat on the floor, hands pressed to the side of his throat. I found this passage was written in a way that was hard to understand and not entirely believable. Accidentally slicing open Joe's neck with a razor blade? Like well, she said she, later on, she said she didn't do it accidentally. She said she did do it uh, deliberately. She's skilled in judo. So this was probably, at least I read it, this was probably something uh, that she did deliberately. Right. Uh, she's already figured out he's a spy at this point And, you know, he's threatened her and all the rest. So I, I thought she did this deliberately. She said she did it deliberately later on. So uh, let's see. Number five, still sitting on the floor, clasping the side of his neck. Joe said, listen, you're very good. You cut my aorta artery in my neck. Giggling, she clapped her hand to her mouth. Another example that the white characters do not seem to exhibit any remorse regarding their actions. Maybe she was somewhat justified, but she's laughing at a man who is dying before her eyes. A man that she's engaged in sexual intercourse with, uh, that they've been hanging out and all the rest, and, you know, eh, oh well. Number six. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow then. Mrs. Abins Abinson, well, I'm struggling to say that. Abinson said finally. And would you give me your name, please? Juliana Frink, she said. Thank you very much, Mrs. Abinson said. So you can just dial up the man in the high castle. I'm finding this whole chapter a little hard to believe given the context of the story. We spent a large part of this book being told how dangerous this book is and the author has a public number puzzling. Now, for that, I would have to reserve judgment to see. Now, how does this all conclude? Uh, I haven't read this book before, uh, but I've read enough of the analysis and things where it starts to get to some of the things that happen in the future. So we'll have to reserve judgment to see. Yeah, we'll have to get more information about this character and, you know, everything that happens from now to the conclusion. Anywho. That catches us up to where we are, uh, chapter 14. Uh, we have folks spectating. Uh, if we have folks who are listening in, any of the folks, if you are listening and interested, this book does reveal quite a bit about white supremacy racism, especially if you keep in mind the time period that this book was written, 1962. This is a white man kicking it with the Black Panthers, right? This is a year before the March on Washington a year before the Birmingham church bombing. That's what's taking place when all of this, when this book is published. So with that as a frame of reference, like, wow, it reveals so much, uh, white anxieties, white genetic annihilation. Sometimes it's stated kind of explicitly, uh, in the text, um, the children's character alone, probably coming up now reveals so much it is challenging to read even one of our investors just said that it can be difficult as i said it might even be one of those books that you have to read more than one and i suspect i would enjoy this a lot more the second time around because now it's like uh inception like i said you take any other uh, of those movies that's a little bit more difficult to pick up everything the second time that you watch it. Now you know everything and all these characters, like you can just kind of kick back and ah, oh, that makes, oh, I didn't get that the first, oh, get to the, yeah, I suspect it would be that sort of thing. Uh, even if you are just listening to the audio, if you go back and listen to the book with the book so that you can follow along, I suspect that you might glean a lot more from the way even just with language in the book. Why does Childen speak broken English? He sounds like so-called Asian people. Why is that? Even when he's not talking to them, he sounds like that. Why is that? Juliana doesn't sound like that. Frank doesn't sound like that. Things to ponder on, so second audio for today and then we'll wrap up with this book next week oh, they will never do Gus Dirty like that again pick a book and then no one participated and they didn't participate from the very first episode totally bailed on us like, oh man I'm not <laughs> to, I'm not hanging out for any of that after they voted for it Whew. 
It was so many people voted for this book. It could fill out an entire NBA roster. We've never had that happen for a Cows book. Never. A whole NBA team and then hanging out by myself. <sighs> Context of white supremacy. Audio segment number two. Chapter 14. The man. This should know the Tagomi thought. Philip K. Dick. There is no answer. Picking up on no understanding. Even in the Oracle. Yet I must go on living day to day anyhow. I will go and find the small, live unseen at any rate, until some later time when... In any case, he said goodbye to his wife and left his house. But today he did not go to the Nippon Times building as usual. What about relaxation? Drive to Golden Gate Park with its zoo and fish. Visit where things who cannot think nonetheless enjoy. Time. It is a long trip for the pedicab, and it gives me more time to perceive, if that can be said. But trees and zoo are not personal. I must clutch at human life. This had made me into a child, although that could be good. I could make it good. The pedicab driver pumped along Kearney Street toward downtown San Francisco. Ride cable car, Mr. Tagomi thought suddenly. Happiness in clearest, almost tear-jerking voyage object that should have vanished in 1900, but is oddly yet extant. He dismissed the pedicab, walked along the sidewalk toward the nearest cable tracks. Perhaps, he thought, I can never go back to the Nippon Times building with its stink of death. My career over, but just as well. A replacement can be found by the Board of Trade Mission Activities. But Tagomi still walks, exists, recalling every detail, so nothing is accomplished. In any case, the war... Operation Dandelion will sweep us all away, no matter what we are doing at the time. Our enemy, alongside whom we fought in the last war, what good did it do us? We should have fought them, possibly, or permitted them to lose, assisted their enemies, the United States, Britain, Russia. Hopeless, wherever one looks. The Oracle enigmatic. Perhaps it is withdrawn from the world of man in sorrow, the sages leaving. We have entered a moment when we are alone. We cannot get assistance as before. Well, Mr. Tagomi thought, perhaps that too is good, or can be made good. One must still try to find the way. He boarded the California Street cable car, rode all the way to the end of the line. He even hopped out and assisted in turning the cable car around on its wooden turntable. That, of all experiences in the city, had the most meaning for him, customarily. Now the effect languished. He felt the void even more acutely, due to vitiation here of all places. Naturally, he rode back. But a formality, he realized as he watched the streets, buildings, traffic pass in reverse of before. Near Stockton, he rose to get off. But at the stop, when he started to descend, the conductor hailed him. Your briefcase, sir. Thank you. He had left it on the cable car. Reaching up, he accepted it, then bowed as the cable car clanged into motion. Very valuable briefcase contents, he thought. Priceless Colt 44 collector's item carried within. Now kept within easy reach constantly, in case vengeful hooligans of SD should try to repay me as individual. One never knows. And yet, Mr. Tagomi felt that this new procedure, despite all that had occurred, was neurotic. I should not yield to it, he told himself once again as he walked along carrying the briefcase. Compulsion, obsession, phobia. But he could not free himself. It in my grip, I in its, he thought. Have I then lost my delighted attitude? He asked himself. Is all instinct perverted from the memory of what I did? All collecting damaged, not merely attitude toward this one item? Mainstay of my life, area, alas, where I dwelt with such relish. Hailing a pedicab, he directed the driver to Montgomery Street and Robert Children's shop. Let us find out. One thread left, connecting me with the voluntary. I possibly could manage my anxious proclivities by a ruse, trade the gun in on more historicity-sanctioned item. This gun, for me, has too much subjective history, all of the wrong kind. But that ends with me. No one else can experience it from the gun, within my psyche only. Free myself, he decided with excitement. When the gun goes, it all leaves the cloud of the past, for it is not merely in my psyche. It is, 
as has always been said in the theory of historicity, within the gun as well, an equation between us. He reached the store, where I have dealt so much, he observed as he paid the driver, both business and private, carrying the briefcase he quickly entered. There, at the cash register, Mr. Childen, polishing with cloth some artifact. Mr. Tigomi, Childen said with a bow. Mr. Childen, he too bowed. What a surprise! I am overcome. Childen put down the object and cloth. Around the corner of the counter he came. Usual ritual, the greeting, etc. Yet Mr. Tagomi felt the man today somehow different, rather muted. An improvement, he decided. Always a trifle loud, shrill, skipping about with agitation. But this might well be a bad omen. Mr. Childen, Mr. Tagomi said, placing his briefcase on the counter and unzipping it. I wish to trade in an item bought several years ago. You do that, I recollect. Yes, Mr. Childen said. Depending on condition, for instance. He watched alertly. Colt 44 revolver, Mr. Tagomi said. They were both silent, regarding the gun as it lay in its open teakwood box, with its carton of partly consumed ammunition. Shade colder by Mr. Childen. Ah, Mr. Tagomi realized. Well, so be it. You are not interested, Mr. Tagomi said. No, sir, Mr. Childen said in a stiff voice. I will not press it. He did not feel any strength. I yield. Yin, the adaptive, receptive, holds sway in me, I fear. Forgive me, Mr. Tagomi. Mr. Tagomi bowed, replaced the gun, ammunition, box, and his briefcase. Destiny. I must keep this thing. You seem quite disappointed, Mr. Childen said. You notice. He was perturbed. Had he let his inner world out for all to view? He shrugged. Certainly it was so. Was there a special reason why you wanted to trade that item in? Mr. Childen said. No, he said, once more concealing his personal world, as should be. Mr. Childen hesitated, then said, I wonder if that did emanate from my store. I do not carry that item. I am sure, Mr. Tagomi said, but it does not matter. I accept your decision. I am not offended. Sir, Childen said, allow me to show you what has come in. Are you free for a moment? Mr. Tagomi felt within him the old stirring. Something of unusual interest? Come, sir. Childen led the way across the store. Mr. Tagomi followed. Within a locked glass case, on trays of black velvet, lay small metal swirls, shapes that merely hinted rather than were. They gave Mr. Tagomi a queer feeling as he stooped to study. I show these ruthlessly to each of my customers, Robert Childen said. Sir, do you know what these are? Jewelry, it appears, Mr. Tagomi said, noticing a pin. These are American-made. Yes, of course, but, sir, these are not the old. Mr. Tagomi glanced up. Sir, these are the new. Robert Childen's white, somewhat drab features were disturbed by passion. This is the new life of my country, sir, the beginning in the form of tiny imperishable seeds of beauty. With due interest, Mr. Tagomi took time to examine in his own hands several of the pieces. Yes, there is something new which animates these, he decided. The law of Tao is borne out here. When yin lies everywhere, the first stirring of light is suddenly alive in the darkest depths. We are all familiar. We have seen it happen before, as I see it here now. And yet for me they are just scraps. I cannot become wrapped as Mr. R. Children here. Unfortunately for both of us, but that is the case. Quite lovely, he murmured, laying down the pieces. Mr. Childen said in a forceful voice, Sir, it does not occur at once. Pardon? The new view in your heart. You are converted, Mr. Tagomi said. I wish I could be. I am not. He bowed. Another time, Mr. Childen said. 
accompanying him to the entrance of the store. He made no move to display any alternative items, Mr. Tagomi noticed. Your certitude is in questionable taste, Mr. Tagomi said. It seems to press untowardly. Mr. Children did not cringe. Forgive me, he said, but I am correct. I sense accurately in these the contracted germ of the future. So be it, Mr. Tagomi said. But your Anglo-Saxon fanaticism does not appeal to me. Nonetheless, he felt a certain renewal of hope, his own hope in himself. Good day, he bowed. I will see you again one of these days. We can perhaps examine your prophecy. Mr. Children bowed, saying nothing. Carrying his briefcase with the Colt 44 within, Mr. Tagomi departed. I go out as I came in, he reflected, still seeking, still without what I need if I am to return to the world. What if I had bought one of those odd, indistinct items, kept it, re-examined, contemplated? Would I have subsequently, through it, found my way back? I doubt it. Those are for him, not me. And yet... Even if one person finds his way, that means there is a way, even if I personally fail to reach it. I envy him. Turning, Mr. Tagomi started back toward the store. There in the doorway stood Mr. Children, regarding him. He had not gone back in. Sir, Mr. Tagomi said, I will buy one of those, whichever you select. I have no faith, but I am currently grasping at straws. He followed Mr. Children through the store once more to the glass case. I do not believe. I will carry it about with me, looking at it at regular intervals. Once every other day, for instance. After two months, if I do not see... You may return it for full credit, Mr. Children said. Thank you, Mr. Tagomi said. He felt better. Sometimes one must try anything, he decided. It is no disgrace. On the contrary, it is a sign of wisdom of recognizing the situation. This will calm you, Mr. Children said. He laid out a single small silver triangle ornamented with hollow drops, black beneath, bright and light-filled above. Thank you, Mr. Tagomi said. By pedicab, Mr. Tagomi journeyed to Portsmouth Square, a little open park on the slope above Kearney Street overlooking the police station. He seated himself on a bench in the sun, Pigeons walked along the paved paths in search of food. On other benches, shabby men read the newspaper or dozed. Here and there, others lay on the grass, nearly asleep. Bringing from his pocket the paper bag marked with the name of Mr. R. Children's store, Mr. Tagomi sat holding the paper bag with both hands, warming himself. Then he opened the bag and lifted out his new possession for inspection in solitude, here in this little grass and path park of old men. He held the squiggle of silver. Reflection of the midday sun, like box-top cereal trinket, sent away acquired Jack Armstrong magnifying mirror. Or, he gazed down into it. Om, as the Brahmins say, shrunk spot in which all is captured, both at least in hint, the size, the shape. He continued to inspect dutifully. Will it come, as Mr. R. Children prophesied? Five minutes, ten minutes... I sit as long as I can. Time, alas, will make us sell it short. What is it I hold, while there is still time? Forgive me, Mr. Tagomi thought in the direction of the squiggle. Pressure on us always to rise and act. Regretfully, he began to put the thing away in its bag. One final hopeful glance. He again scrutinized with all that he had. Like child, he told himself, imitate the innocence and faith. On seashore, pressing randomly found shell to head, hearing in its blabber the wisdom of the sea. This, with eye replacing ear. Enter me and inform what has been done, what it means, why. Compression of understanding into one finite squiggle. Asking too much, and so get nothing. Listen, he said sotto voce to the squiggle. Sales warranty promised much. If I shake it violently like old recalcitrant watch, he did so up and down, or like dice in critical game, awaken the deity inside, 
peradventure he sleepeth, or he is on a journey, titillating heavy irony by Prophet Elijah, or he is pursuing. Mr. Tagomi violently shook the silver squiggle up and down in his clenched fist once more. Call him louder. Again he scrutinized. You little thing, you are empty, he thought. Curse at it, he told himself. Frighten it. My patience is running out, he said sotto voce. And what then? Fling you in the gutter? Breathe on it? Shake it? Breathe on it? Win me the game. He laughed. Addle-pitted involvement here in warm sunlight. Spectacle to whoever comes along, peeking about guiltily now. But no one saw. Old men snoozing. Measure of relief there. Tried everything, he realized. Pleaded, contemplated, threatened, philosophized at length. What else can be done? Could I but stay here? It is denied me. Opportunity will perhaps occur again. And yet, as W. S. Gilbert says, such an opportunity will not occur again. Is that so? I feel it to be so. When I was a child, I thought as a child. But now I have put away childish things. Now I must seek in other realms. I must keep after this object in new ways. I must be scientific, exhaust by logical analysis every entree, systematically, in classic Aristotelian laboratory manner. He put his finger in his right ear to shut off traffic and all other distracting noises. Then he tightly held the silver triangle, shell-wise, to his left ear. No sound. No roar of simulated ocean. In actuality, interior blood-motion noises. Not even that. Then what other sense might apprehend mystery? Hearing of no use, evidently. Mr. Jagomi shut his eyes and began fingering every bit of surface on the item. Not touch. His fingers told him nothing. Smell. He put the silver close to his nose and inhaled. Metallic faint odor, but it conveyed no meaning. Taste. Opening his mouth, he sneaked the silver triangle within, popped it in like a cracker, but of course refrained from chewing. No meaning. Only bitter, hard, cold thing. He again held it in his palm. Back at last to seeing. Highest ranking of the senses. Greek scale of priority. He turned the silver triangle each and every way. He viewed it from every extra rem standpoint. What do I see? He asked himself. Due to long, patient, painstaking study. What is clue of truth that confronts me in this object? Yield, he told the silver triangle. Cough up arcane secret. Like frog pulled from depths, he thought. Clutched in fist, given command to declare what lies below in the watery abyss. But here the frog does not even mock. It strangles silently, becomes stone or clay or mineral, inert, passes back to the rigid substance familiar in its tomb world. Metal is from the earth, he thought as he scrutinized. From below, from that realm which is the lowest, the most dense. Land of trolls and caves, dank, always dark. Yin world, in its most melancholy aspect. World of corpses, decay and collapse. Of feces, all that has died, slipping and disintegrating back down layer by layer. The demonic world of the immutable, the time that was. And yet, in the sunlight, the silver triangle glittered. It reflected light. Fire, Mr. Tagomi thought. Not dank or dark object at all. Not heavy, weary, but pulsing with life. The high realm, aspect of Yang, Empyrean, ethereal, as befits work of art. Yes, that is artist's job. Takes mineral rock from dark, silent earth, transforms it into shining, light-reflecting form from sky. Has brought the dead to life. Corpse turned to fiery display. The past has yielded to the future. Which are you? he asked the silver squiggle. Dark dead yin or brilliant living yang? In his palm the silver squiggle danced and blinded him. He squinted, seeing now only the play of fire. Body of yin, soul of yang, metal and fire unified, the outer and inner, microcosmos in my palm. What is the space which this speaks of? Vertical ascent, to heaven, of time, into the light world of the mutable. Yes, this thing has disgorged its spirit, light, and my attention is fixed. I can't look away. Spellbound by mesmerizing, shimmering surface which I can no longer control, no longer free to dismiss. Now talk to me, he told it. 
now that you have snared me. I want to hear your voice issuing from the blinding clear white light, such as we expect to see only in the Bardo Thodol afterlife existence. But I do not have to wait for death, for the decomposition of my animus as it wanders in search of a new womb. All the terrifying and beneficent deities, we will bypass them, and the smoky lights as well, and the couples in coitus, everything except this light. I am ready to face without terror. Notice I do not blench. I feel the hot winds of karma driving me. Nevertheless, I remain here. My training was correct. I must not shrink from the clear white light. For if I do, I will once more re-enter the cycle of birth and death, never knowing freedom, never obtaining release. The veil of Maya will fall once more if I... The light disappeared. He held the dull silver triangle only. Shadow had cut off the sun. Mr. Tagomi glanced up. Tall, blue-suited policeman standing by his bench, smiling. Eh? Mr. Tagomi said, startled. I was just watching you work that puzzle. The policeman started on along the path. Puzzle? Mr. Tagomi echoed. Not a puzzle. Isn't that one of those little puzzles you have to take apart? My kid has a whole lot of them. Some are hard. The policeman passed on. Mr. Tagomi thought, Spoiled. My chance at Nirvana, gone. Interrupted by that white barbarian Neanderthal yank. That subhuman supposing I worked a child's puerile toy. Rising from the bench, he took a few steps unsteadily. Must calm down. Dreadful, low-class, jingoistic, racist invectives, unworthy of me. Incredible, unredemptive passions clashing in my breast. He made his way through the park. Keep moving, he told himself. Catharsis in motion. He reached periphery of park. Sidewalk, Kearney Street. Heavy, noisy traffic. Mr. Tagomi halted at the curb. No pedicabs. He walked along the sidewalk instead. He joined the crowd. Never can get one when you need it. God, what is that? He stopped, gaped at hideous, misshapen thing on skyline, like nightmare of roller coasters suspended, blotting out view, enormous construction of metal and cement in air. Mr. Tagomi turned to a passerby, a thin man in rumpled suit. What is that? he demanded, pointing. The man grinned. Awful, ain't it? That's the Embarcadero Freeway. A lot of people think it stinks up the view. I never saw it before. Mr. Tagomi said. You're lucky, the man said and went on. Mad dream, Mr. Tagomi thought. Must wake up. Where are the pedicabs today? He began to walk faster. Whole vista has dull, smoky, tomb-world cast. Smell of burning. Dim gray buildings. Sidewalk. Peculiar harsh tempo in people. And still no pedicabs. Cab, he shouted as he hurried along. Hopeless. Only cars and buses. Cars like brutal big crushers, all unfamiliar in shape. He avoided seeing them, kept his eyes straight ahead. Distortion of my optic perception of particularly sinister nature. A disturbance affecting my sense of space. Horizon twisted out of line, like lethal astigmatism striking without warning. Must obtain respite. Ahead, a dingy lunch counter. Only whites within, all supping. Mr. Tagomi pushed open the wooden swinging doors. Smell of coffee. Grotesque jukebox in corner blaring out. He winced and made his way to the counter. All stools taken by whites. Mr. Tagomi exclaimed. Several whites looked up. But none departed their places. None yielded their stools to him. They merely resumed supping. I insist, Mr. Tagomi said loudly to the first white. He shouted in the man's ear. The man put down his coffee mug and said, Watch it, Tojo. Mr. Tagomi looked to the other whites, all watched with hostile expressions, and none stirred. Bardo Thodol existence, Mr. Tagomi thought. Hot winds blowing me who knows where. This is vision of what? Can the animus endure this? Yes, the Book of the Dead prepares us. After death we seem to glimpse others, but all appear hostile to us. One stands isolated, unsuckered wherever one turns. The terrible journey, and always the realms of suffering, rebirth, ready to receive the fleeing, demoralized spirit. The delusions. He hurried from the lunch counter. The door swung together behind him. He stood once more on the sidewalk. Where am I? 
out of my world, my space and time. The silver triangle disoriented me. I broke from my moorings and hence stand on nothing. So much for my endeavor. Lesson to me forever. One seeks to contravene one's perceptions. Why? So that one can wander utterly lost without signposts or guide? This hypnagogic condition, attention faculty diminished so that twilight state obtains, world seen merely in symbolic archetypal aspect, totally confused with unconscious material, typical of hypnosis-induced somnambulism, must stop this dreadful gliding among shadows, refocus concentration, and thereby restore ego center. He felt in his pockets for the silver triangle. Gone. Left the thing on the bench in the park with briefcase. Catastrophe. Crouching, he ran back up the sidewalk to the park. Dozing bums eyed him in surprise as he hurried up the path. There, the bench. And leaning against it still, his briefcase. No sign of the silver triangle. He hunted. Yes, fallen through to grass, it lay partly hidden, where he had hurled it in rage. He reseated himself, panting for breath. Focus on silver triangle once more, he told himself when he could breathe. Scrutinize it forcefully and count. At ten, utter startling noise. Ervach, for instance. Idiotic daydreaming of fugal type, he thought. Emulation of more noxious aspects of adolescence, rather than the clear-headed, pristine innocence of authentic childhood. Just what I deserve, anyhow. All my own fault. No intention by Mr. R. Children or artisans. My own greed to blame. One cannot compel understanding to come. He counted slowly, aloud, and then jumped to his feet. Goddamn stupidity! he said sharply. Mists cleared? He peeped about. Diffusion subsided, in all probability. Now one appreciates St. Paul's incisive word choice, seen through glass darkly, not a metaphor, but astute reference to optical distortion. We really do see astigmatically, in fundamental sense, our space and our time creations of our own psyche, and when these momentarily falter, like acute disturbance of middle ear, occasionally we list eccentrically, all sense of balance gone. He reseated himself, put the silver squiggle away in his coat pocket, sat holding his briefcase on his lap. What I must do now, he told himself, is go and see if that malignant construction, what did the man call it, Embarcadero Freeway, if it is still palpable. But he felt afraid to. And yet, he thought, I can't really sit here. I have loads to lift, as old U.S. folk expression has it. Jobs to be done. Dilemma. Two small Chinese boys came scampering noisily along the path. A flock of pigeons fluttered up. The boys paused. Mr. Tagomi called. You, young fellows. He dug into his pocket. Come here. The two boys guardedly approached. Here's a dime. Mr. Tagomi tossed them a dime. The boys scrambled for it. Go down to Kearney Street and see if there are any pedicabs. Come back and tell me. Will you give us another dime? One of the boys said. When we get back? Yes, Mr. Tagomi said. But tell me the truth. The boys raced off along the path. If there are not, Mr. Tagomi thought, I would be well advised to retire to secluded place and kill myself. He clutched his briefcase. Still have the weapon. No difficulty there. The boys came tearing back. Six! One of them yelled. I counted six. I counted five! The other boy gasped. Mr. Tagomi said, You are sure they were pedicabs? You distinctly saw the drivers peddling? Yes, sir, the boys said together. He gave each boy a dime. They thanked him and ran off. Back to office and job, Mr. Tagomi thought. He rose to his feet, gripping the handle of his briefcase. Duty calls. Customary day once again. Once more he walked down the path to the sidewalk. Cab, he called. From the traffic a pedicab appeared. The driver came to a halt at the curb, his dark face glistening, chest heaving. Yes, sir. Take me to the Nippon Times building, Mr. Tagomi ordered. He ascended to the seat and made himself comfortable. Pedaling furiously, the pedicab driver moved out among the other cabs and cars. Context of white supremacy. Uh, that will wrap up uh, our second audio segment. So next week we will complete the book. Um, if there is anyone, if you've been listening to the archives or any of the folks who... 
uh, pretended, uh, saw like 30 minutes of the TV series and felt for whatever reason that they would be interested in reading this book. If you have any concluding thoughts, feel free to drop us an email uh, for next week. Uh, we will wrap the book up, uh, Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle. Uh, the number is 720-716-7300. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. The email until justice at gmail.com. Uh, let's see. So I'll get back to our emails. Uh, so one of our investors, I'll uh, maybe go in reverse order of what we did previously. So this is uh, one of our male investors uh, who wrote in. I'll start with his commentary this time around. Let's see. So he writes, uh, Chapter 14, <clears throat> Still Seeking. Still without what I need, if I am to return to the world, what if I had bought one of those odd indistinct items, kept it, re-examined, contemplated, would I have subsequently, through it, found my way back? I doubt it. Those are for him, not me. And yet, even if one person finds his way, that means there is a way. Even if I personally fail to reach it, I envy the way the Tao or Taoism described as the ultimate principle underlying reality. My very brief research describes it as a philosophy that dates back to the 4th century BCE in China. The four main principles are the principle of oneness with nature, dynamic balance that's mentioned a lot in this book and some other folks. Uh, cyclical growth and harmonious action, harmony. Avoidance of conflict seems to be an important aspect. Interesting that the author has the Japanese practicing a Chinese philosophy. I think that is pointed out in the book as a, as a point of uh, ridicule. I think it's Childan ridicules them for this and saying that that's the Japanese. They just ape and, and mimic everybody. Uh, they had to go even be talking about that exactly, uh, that they went and just got old Chinese spiritual practice. They can't even, you know, come up with something creative on their own. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The Tao reminds me a little about what Neely Fuller describes as the way to becoming a universal man, universal woman. Hmm. Number two, my patience is running out, he said, sort of voice. Lower one's voice. So it's sotto voce, lower one's voice. Number three, Mr. Chikomi, I said language, very important in this book. Number three, Mr. Chikomi thought, spoiled, my chance at nirvana, gone, interrupted by that white barbarian. Now, this is the second time, or excuse me, third time, third time that a white person is referred to as a barbarian in this book. And the first two times, it was children. What do we make of a white author who repeatedly is having white people referred to as barbarians? He continues, uh, interrupted by that white barbarian Neanderthal yank, the subhuman, supposing I worked a child's puerile toy. Rising from the bench, he took a few steps unsteadily, must calm down, dreadful, low-class, jingoistic, racist, invectives, unworthy of me, incredible, unredemptive passions clashing. Unlike the white people, the Japanese at least question their incorrect behavior. The white people are very comfortable with practicing racism and demonstrate without introspection. Very important. And I think that several of the folks who've written in it said the exact same thing, that they noticed the same parallel uh, where it seems like the non-white characters at least have some form of uh, morality about what they're doing. Let's see. Mm -mm. Number four, several whites looked up, but none departed their places. None yielded their stools to him. They merely resumed supping. I insist. 
Mr. Dagomi said loudly to the first white. He shouted in the man's ear. The man put down his coffee mug and said, Watch it, Tojo. Mr. Dagomi looked to the other whites, all watched with hostile expressions, and none stirred. Tagomi's dream experience interestingly gives him a glimpse of what reality is like for a non-white victim, like briefly so. Anti-Asian violence. I never even heard Tojo before. What, is that? what does that mean? Has it, what, did anybody look that up, Tojo? Number five. <clears throat> Man, y'all are killing me. Come on. Bardo Dodo Dodo Existence. Mr. Tikomi thought. Tibetan books of the dead purpose to guide one through consciousness after death. Referenced in a lot of drug literature, such as the books of Timothy Leary, who popularized LSD. I did play that sound clip some weeks back. This is a difficult book also because this is a drug addict white man. Lest we not forget. (sighs) Number six, where am I? Out of my world, my space and time? The silver triangle disoriented me. I broke from my moorings and hence stand on nothing. So much for my endeavor. Lesson to me forever. One seeks to contravene one's perceptions. Why? So that one can wander utterly lost without signposts or guide? This hypnagogic condition, attention faculty diminished so that twilight state obtains. World seen merely in symbolic, archetypal aspect, totally confused with unconscious material. Typical of hypnosis-induced somnambulism must stop this dreadful gliding among shadows, refocus concentration, and thereby restore ego center. He felt in his pockets for the silver triangle. Gone. After reading this section, I am beginning to think that this book is the author's translation of a joke. Uh, After reading this section, I am beginning to think that this book is the author's translation of a dream or drug-altered state into a novel. He has written in a style that maintains the dream-like quality. It explains the choppy sentence, well, not all of them, at least unless, you know, I missed it, making all your important decisions with what amounts to a Ouija board. (laughs) He's called it a Ouija board. Come on. And absurd events, killing Nazis with an anti-gun. Now, again, I don't think that's an anti-gun. I think that is, you know, that's already been thrown out. This might just be a fake. That's why it works so well, but, you know, whatever. Accidentally murdering someone with a razor. I don't think that was accidental. And Benson having a listed phone number. However, I may just be completely confused about this book. I might be confused about it, too. I did get a 92% on my quiz, but whatever. Um, The... Choppy sentences that the words are so important in this book. Some of the times the choppy sentences are because it is a Japanese person, non-white person speaking English, and they, you know, it's the typical way that they would think about uh, what do they call it, fresh off the boat, and you can't speak English well, right? So that's some of it. Sometimes it's Robert Children specifically. He speaks with choppy sentences. It's I think. That he's living in uh, the Pacific states, and he's all grafting, right, and trying to be obsequious, currying favor with uh, the Japanese in the Pacific states. Uh, I think children's character is speaking in choppy sentences uh, because that's the domination, and I think that's one of the ways that Philip K. Dick is showing that the white people are not in power. The children's character speaks like he sounds like he uh, speaks English the way that the Japanese people do. Uh, I think that's super important. That's why I say there's so many things to think about, and that also would make this book difficult. Now, some of the times the choppy sentences are because you are getting what this this passage right here from Tagomi. He doesn't speak the best English, right? He's Japanese, but... He gives lots of stream of conscience uh, passages, like all the different points of view. So sometimes it's regular uh, character dialogue, right? And that won't the the the, uh, language won't be choppy there. But when it starts becoming like stream of consciousness, 
then the grammar is not always perfect and people don't necessarily think in perfect sentences. You know, you might be, especially if you get emotional, which happens sometimes with these characters. That's why I said it's a lot to kind of process. Absolutely. At the end of the day, drug addict white man writing this book in the 1960s when LSD was very popular. And he's in California, East Bay, where all of this was very popular, all the drugs and LSD and experimentation and all that. So, I mean, bingo on the money. But I also do think there are some very intentional components to the language and specifically children's character uh, speaking in a really choppy uh, manner. And then even some of the other characters when they're having stream of consciousness, like what he just shared from Tagomi. Anywho, uh, he gets to chapter 15. We didn't get that far, so we'll have to pick up there for next week. Uh, picking up all of our notes, going back to our other caller who wrote, investor, excuse me, who wrote in. Let's see. All right, so now we pick up chapter 14 when Mr. Tagomi gets the silver triangle. This as I said, different investor, Chi, writes, so when Mr. Tomey gets the silver triangle from Chill Dan, <laughs> that's the way she wrote it, and sits on the park bench to contemplate it, that part was much more significant than I have time to describe. But once he gets to the alternate reality where whites are not subordinate to the so-called Japanese anymore and walks in that diner, page 181, all stools taken by whites, uh, Mr. Jagomi exclaimed, Several whites looked up, but none departed their places. None yielded their stools to him. They merely resumed supping. I insist, Mr. Tagomi said loudly to the first white. He shouted in the man's ear. The man put down his coffee mug and said, oh, coffee mug, come on, that's a well moment. It's so many, well, <sighs> you would have to read. That's all I can really, you would really, you would have to be reading and looking at all of this to really pick out all of the details and why this is important, what it reveals about white supremacy racism. But Dr. Welsing talked about that at the last Welsing Institute where she mentioned Man in the High Castle, not that she read the book, but just all the propaganda around the promotion of the series. Uh, but coffee and the significance, she even talked about in World War II how important that was to war getting that morning cup of joe. Black. Anyway, uh, put in his cup of coffee and said, watch it, Tojo. Now, I know name calling is incorrect, but that was the funniest line in the book I cracked up. It is pretty <laughs> It has a lot of humorous moments, racist jokes, you know, racial slurs all throughout. Uh, on to Juliana. It took her quite a while to realize what exactly did she realize about Joe, that he was up to no good. I'm not sure if he's a Nazi, but he's definitely a race soldier, and she acted in such a crazy, out-of-it manner. This lady swallowed two razor blades and then killed Joe and got in the car and drove away. She seemed to get uncrazy pretty swiftly after the murder. The whole part was pretty weird. How did she change reality? Was it the pen used to clasp her dress? Was it the act of killing Joe that changed reality? I'm not sure. It's ambiguous. Or did she go see the absentence in the alternate reality that Mr. Tagomi created or happened upon? I don't understand, and the text doesn't make it clear. Insert drug addict white author. I wish I had more understanding of the ending. Oh, wait a minute. We didn't get that far. So, we we'll have to get there next week. Sorry, stop right there. We'll have to come back and pick that up next week. Uh, we didn't get that far in the text. That'll be next week when we wrap all of this up uh, for uh, yeah, our last session. It will be one half of a session for next week. Uh, I will share a few notes on this section for this week, and then I'll share the rest next week. Uh, something happened with the Wi-Fi as we were broadcasting, and so I got distracted trying to see if I could get that restored, and I could not. <laughs> so I wasted all this time and lost my place and crazy for the part of the book. Like, this is like, oh, my goodness, like the worst of the worst. This is the part I was waiting for. I told you all this was the section where I was like, oh, man, apparently at some point the Asian fella falls out of this world and falls into, like, the real 1962 like what an, and i said from the drug addict white author how does this happen is he on a spaceship is there like 
tell me something. Is there a DeLorean from Back to the Future? Like, is one of these uh, pieces of jewelry, like some sort of amulet, like you rub it and it, you know, moves you to a different, you know, universe or dimension, like all of that drug addict white man. Anyway, um, to Gomi, so he's still really shaken up about uh, having to kill these two Nazi hooligan thugs. Uh, he drives to Golden Gate Park, and again, I was all touched. It's like, oh man, I've been to Golden Gate Park when I lived in. Anyway, uh, and then uh, so he goes through all that, and uh, he says, "Now I'm going to keep my firearm with me in case the vengeful hooligans of the SD should try to repay me as an individual." Um, again, having I guess you can you can name call Nazis. Apparently, I'm not accustomed to hearing hooligan. I'm generally waiting for like Trayvon Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King. Jonathan Crawford III, Tamir Rice, Khalif Browder, Gus T. Renegade. That's what I'm I'm waiting for when they say hooligan. Like, it's got to be a black male. Got to be some black dude that we're talking about. So to consistently have the words thug and hooligan being used to refer to white people, wow, very alternate universe. Uh, let's see. So Tagomi is all shook up. He goes to Childen's um, antique school to return the gun. Think about that now in terms of morality. And even think about it on a larger scale. So this gun is supposed to have value in the text. They make up the term uh, historicity, I think is how they say it, uh, that this gun is supposed to have because it's supposed to be a Civil War relic meaning it's more valuable because this gun has been used to kill people, right? It's been a part of a war where there were all kinds of murders and killing all kinds of people. Um, uh, Tagomi, now that he's used this gun, which, again, I think is a fake. That's a big part. We've already, that was a big part of the book. Um, children finding out, like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, these guns are fake. How many of them are fake? And I can't even pick them out. Like, oh, my gosh, this could mess up the whole industry. So, I think, you know, this gun is a fake. That's why it works so well. It's a fake. It's probably brand new, and they just aged it a little bit. Um, but he wants to get rid of it. Like, I don't want any connection to this, and, you know, it's got bad karma. You know, let me trade it in for something else. That is totally different uh, in the system of racism, white supremacy. A race soldier uses a gun to kill, pick any of the folks that I just mentioned. Uh, they use that gun becomes worth, like, priceless, a billion dollars, never going to sell it, keep it forever, that type of a thing. Or let me, let's, let's come pose with the gun next to the nigger that we killed, a la Fred Hampton. I don't think Chicago get mentioned here. Uh, but he wants to sell it back. And as I said, important, I said, I think this gun is a fake. Well, he goes to sell it back. Children doesn't want it. Why doesn't he want it? This gun is a fake. He's probably looking at it. I am good. <laughs> they got all these fakes rolling around. I'm good. No, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not even on that anymore. I'm trying to get on this jewelry thing. Uh, and then he looks at it. Oh, yeah, this probably didn't even come uh, from my shop because he's saying, oh, yeah, that's a fake. When he finds out it's a fake, that might be why he, he might even be thinking. That's why he wants to get rid of it. Like, yeah, he found out that this is a fake. Oh, no, nah, that didn't even come from me. You got that from somewhere else. You dropped it too? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. So. Uh, they go through all that. He's not going to take it back. He's like, okay, so come look at this uh, tacky jewelry uh, that I got here. Come check some of that out. So at first, Mr. Tagomi is, you know, hey, I'm good. Uh, and he leaves, but he's so shaken up by this whole thing. He's like, oh, man, you know, i got to try anything that will get me back on the way. Now, on the one hand, I can totally appreciate um, recognizing, right, I'm not doing – and I have not killed anyone, so, hey. <laughs> but having to kill someone – uh, and being t having to kill someone and not recognizing having to kill someone and all right I was just making sure I didn't want to uh, be talking and not being heard as I said I lost uh, my Wi-Fi so I don't have my switchboard uh, in front of me and I was thinking oh my goodness this could be something crazy where I'm not being heard. Uh, Uh, let's see. Retired firefighter in Florida. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, did commentary to say, share, sir? Or were you just speaking in and say, "Oh no, we're not hearing you"? Oh, I can hear you all. I can hear you all the way. Uh, so I don't think there's anything wrong. I, I was I was going to uh, to uh, give a idea 
uh, of uh, something that you uh, mentioned earlier about some, something about Tojo. And you, you oh, asked, yes, sir. But I, I was just thinking it's probably it's not relevant now since you talk way beyond it. But if it is relevant, I, I, I have an idea about Let's it. Let's hear it. Uh, Hadiki Tojo was the uh, was a top official in Japan during World War II, military official, uh, uh, minister of the uh, military, I think, to be exact, the army, to be exact. Uh, he was his his name was very popular. Uh, uh, when it was when when it comes to associating with Japan's military force, and uh, it was a lot of jokes made about him, uh, propaganda propaganda from uh, uh, white people in this part of the world. Uh, his name was uh, most popular, even more popular than the uh, than the uh, uh, Hirohito. Uh, he was more popular than Hirohito. He, he was the, the, uh, basically the, uh, the uh, image of Japanese treachery <laughs> during that time. Uh, uh, and in turn, when, uh, when they forced Japan into surrender, of course he was put up, put up uh, on trial as a war criminal, criminal and hung. Yeah. So that that I I don't know exactly what that phrase that you was talking about meant, but I know his name had something to do with it in some kind of connection. That's that's what I was just calling about. A plus uh, retired firefighter in Florida. I had no idea. I had never heard of uh, General. Uh, Hideki Tojo. Uh, I'd never see. That was another thing I think some people said that made this book so challenging was that it does have quite a bit of World War II history. Uh, and so the more World War II history you know, that's why I said I suspect. Man, I got to ask Mr. Fuller, did he read this book? Uh, or if he has some free time, maybe if he's twiddling his thumbs this summer, uh, he can check this out. Cause I suspect he would geek off of this. Uh, he know. I'm sure he would Tojo. He, oh yeah, that's right. Hold on. <laughs> And all of this, so I'm sure he would love this. Um, but yeah, that's that. I guess I guess uh, if you were alive during that time, that would have been the common racial slur that you would. It would have been incidents like what they describe in the book. He goes in the bar, watch it, Tojo. That would have been, you know, the type of thing that you would have heard, uh, as opposed to Negra. Uh, for so-called Asian people, it would have been Tojo. Like, that is uh, – and I'm sure Philip Dick, uh, K. Dick heard that, especially being in San Francisco because they have such a high population then and now uh, during the 60s of uh, Asian people, so-called. Oh, yeah, I'm sure he heard quite a bit of Tojo uh, in that – and Seattle, same thing. So, yeah, and uh, I'm just reading online the first report that I found. It says uh, – Hideki Tojo was a Japanese politician, general of the Imperial Japanese Army, and convicted war criminal who served as Prime Minister of Japan and President of the Imperial Rule Assistance Association for most of World War II. Uh, he was sentenced to death as a war criminal uh, and executed uh, following all of this was World War II, but obviously, I guess, or I guess, yeah. So, in the when Tagomi falls out into the real world, that's what he's getting. Like, oh yeah, no Count Tojo that we've already executed. Shut up, sit down. <laughs> Nobody's giving up a seat so that you can sit in. Uh, and then Tojo runs. I mean, uh, Mister Tagomi runs from this environment. Like, oh my God, I can't believe it. This is crazy. Which, yeah. That's the real world. Yikes. Anti-Asian violence. The masters. Um, much obliged retired firefighter in Florida. Excellent contribution. Uh, let's see. Um, I think I'm going to have to probably save the rest of my commentary for Chapter 14 until next week, as I said, because I got dislodged from the best section of the book, uh, racial slurs and how all of this happened. Again, Drug addict white man. I uh, cannot say that enough. Like, 
How did this even happen? How did he fall out of the universe? How did he get back? Was he on drugs? Was it the the jewelry that did this? Like, what kind of jewelry is this? (laughs) Like, uh, sheesh, Uh, science fiction. My goodness. Let's see. Okay, just making sure. Didn't have any other uh, commentary from folks that they wanted to share. Uh, Folks can be thinking of final thoughts that they would like to share for next week as we wrap up the book. If any of the folks have been listening in the archives or what have you, even thinking about that as we finish it out next week, the man in the high castle. Ponder on that one, uh, what Mr. Philip K. Dick may be trying to convey to us with that as well. Uh, and this book, like I said, it's so nutty that it, the, many aspects of it would lead you to kind of question what is he saying. Um, even uh, when our investor, when he wrote in, like uh, with Juliana, she seemed to kind of go crazy a little bit, and then she got uncrazy. Uh, that kind of, I think, understanding of what is happening as you get a better understanding, sometimes that can kind of uncrazy you when she figures out, you know, the reality about who this Joe character is and what he's up to, what this has all been about. Uh, and killing someone can kind of sober you up really quick, too, when you got to, you know, abscond that Nazis might be coming after you for all of this. Um, but, yeah, it gives a lot of things to kind of think about. Um, and even the gun, like I said, the gun is a great equalizer, right? Dr. Welsing, and we got fake guns here, and then we got to get rid of guns, people feeling bad about having to use uh, a firearm and all the rest, so it's quite a bit to to process. We'll wrap it all up next week. I guess most people have been thoroughly uninterested in all of that, even though they requested to read this book, but neither here nor there. We will finish it all up uh, next week. Uh, if folks have any uh, final thoughts and what have you, you can think of all that as uh, we get ready for uh, a new book after next week, and it'll be short. We'll just have one audio segment, and then we'll push off. Uh, let's see. I do not see any uh, other hands. Uh, if folks have commentary or what have you that you emailed in, next week hopefully we'll do this and won't have any Wi-Fi problems, so I will be able to easily check my email and all the rest of it. Uh, with that, we'll be here tomorrow for Neutralizing Workplace Racism, same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, sobriety would be best under conditions of white terrorism. We need fully functioning brain computers to solve this problem. <laughs> Philip K. Dick, example right there. Sobriety would be best. In addition to being sober, if you're out and about, firearms, man, uh, you should be thinking if someone is being rowdy and hostile, they may be armed. If you didn't leave your uh, residence prepared to kill and or die, exit. You are not having confrontations. You have no idea if they're armed and with an armed entourage. If you're in a vehicle, you are sober, buckled up, not on your cell phone. Uh, We need all of our attention to kind of be aware of what's happening, and we're trying to do the small things that we can to minimize contact with the race soldiers, badge or no. That's it. Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cal signing out. Thanks all for tuning in.